This video is about Escape from Tarkov's audio. This video is also about the Escape from Tarkov community. The stories we tell each other, the advice we give, the relationship between those we consider the arbiters of information and those that seek it and those that spread it. This video is about Tarkov, but it's really about much more than that. This video is ultimately about truth, how we go about determining what's true and not just what we believe, but why. I'm going to be diving into a comprehensive list of topics related to audio and Escape from Tarkov, focusing on all sorts of relevant issues, features, and challenges the community faces when it comes to obtaining and sharing knowledge about our favorite game. I'm going to be answering pretty much every conceivable Tarkov-related audio question that you could think to ask. Why don't we hear footsteps in stairwells or on other floors and buildings? How do enemies just run up to me without making a sound? What's Steam audio or binaural sound? Are they buggy or broken? How are they going to affect performance? What's the difference between stereo audio and things like 5.1 or 7.1 surround sound? Are they good for gaming? Are they going to work with my headphones? What about technologies like Dolby Atmos and Windows Sonic? Should I be using those? How do the in-game skills like perception or things like active headphones change what we hear? How about audio compression or equalization? Will they improve my in-game sound or give me some sort of an advantage? You might have looked at the length of this video and thought, Jesus, I'm not watching all of that. I genuinely mean it when I say that every bit of this video has valuable information, important and useful that every single Tarkov community member should hear from start to finish. If you have to listen to it in chunks or over the course of a couple of days, do it. If you have to watch only a single video of mine ever, I want this to be the one. I'm going to be diving into not only every single one of the audio related bugs that pretty much everybody's been talking about for years, but I'm also going to be discussing many of the countless misconceptions, rumors, and controversies that have arisen within the Tarkov community about all sorts of topics from cheaters to netcode, ballistics, and everything in between. This video is a breakdown of exactly what, how, and why so many have gotten so much wrong for so long. So now, without further ado, let's crack straight. Yo, what level, uh, what level strength do you have? <laughs> In July of 2017, Escape from Tarkov officially entered the open beta stage. It already featured an audio system with an impressive level of attention to detail with its high quality sound effects and immersive environmental ambiance. What also came as a result of Battlestate's ambitious ground up implementation coupled with their relative inexperience was a number of inevitable challenges and issues. We've experienced audio issues of all kinds consistently from the beginning. The sort of issues we'd expect from any early access indie game and just about every step of the way this topic was met with confusion, frustration and controversy. Fast forward three years to May of 2020 when we were introduced to the most significant change that Tarkov's audio had ever seen, the long-awaited first iteration of something called Steam Audio. A month later, due to the obvious community confusion surrounding this feature, I put together a video that went into detail about Tarkov's audio, covering some of the core aspects and downsides of Tarkov's existing audio system, explaining what Steam Audio is, how it works, and breaks down the different aspects of it that were added to Tarkov a month before, as well as the aspects of it that had not yet been implemented in Tarkov. Everything in that video still stands, and although I'm going to be covering a decent amount that I already discussed in that video, I'd still recommend watching that later if you want more information on the subject. One of the biggest takeaways was that at the time, the addition of Steam Audio was a game changer for so many of us in the community, literally adding an entirely new dimension to the experience. See, like, I can tell it's right there. That's pretty fucking sick. November 13th, 2020 was patch 12.8. After a minor update to Tarkov's game engine, Unity, aimed at providing some important performance improvements, it was discovered that the current version of Steam Audio had some compatibility issues with the current version of Unity that Tarkov was running on. Because of this issue, Steam Audio had been temporarily disabled. The five months without Steam Audio that would follow this patch is widely regarded by many in the community as one of the worst periods in Tarkov's history. March 30th, 2021. Patch 12.10. Steam Audio was back. 
Finally, the dark ages of Tarkov audio was over. Or so we thought. Pretty much immediately after the patch was released, people started to experience some, let's just say, weird behavior. Two weeks later, on April 15th, came a minor patch that fixed the quote phantom sounds with binaural audio. For the next seven months, things remained generally trouble free. That was until November 10th. Patch 12.11.7 included the long awaited Unity 2019 engine update. All of a sudden, it seemed as though we were visited by the ghost of Tarkov's past, except this time, tenfold. Luckily, less than a week later, on November 16th, there came a minor update that included technical fixes that got rid of the really bad ghost sounds for a large portion of the community. Let's fast forward to today, currently March of 2022. In the three months since the wipe that's come along with 12.12, .12, there's countless reports of all kinds of audio issues from all kinds of folks. Lots of us have been experiencing some of these ghost sounds, some more than others, some seemingly worse than others, it seems like a hot topic at the moment. Nikita even recently posted on Reddit asking the community about their concerns and issues, and in a tweet he acknowledged that audio issues accounted for 95% of the messages. So, how do I explain the current state of affairs and how we got here? I'm well known as someone who has openly recommended folks use Steam Audio pretty much since day one. But why do I recommend it when most of the big names in the communities have it off and say they hate it? What about all the people who say it's buggy? Way more than just ghost sounds, it's completely broken. It destroys their in-game performance, they can't localize sound at all with it. Are they all wrong? I'm suddenly reminded of the old adage, sometimes you're the windshield, sometimes you're the bug. Well in our case, sometimes the reason why you died in Escape from Tarkov is because of a bug. In which case, you were the bug. So, so technically the bug was the windshield. Wait, does that make the game the windshield? Or Once. Once. Calm down, stop shooting! Calm the fuck down. Can we all just enjoy each other's company? We all do this together. We don't have to kill each other. We will have to. I can't believe you did that! <laughs> Let's get right into the thick of it and examine the different criticisms about the audio, the bugs that people experience, and try to actually suss out what's going on in most of these cases. Over the last few years, I've been paying close attention to the state of Tarkov Audio, the community's opinions, suspicions, and claims about it, engaging with the community as much as I can about these kinds of topics regularly. Unfortunately, the nature of these conversations between content creators and community members on most platforms don't exactly make for easy reference or review after the fact. On platforms like Twitch, the live conversations are ephemeral, disappearing after a couple of months unless they're clipped or recorded in their full context. And things like podcasts, YouTube videos, or their comment sections they end up buried somewhere in the middle of hundreds of hours of recordings or amidst an uncategorized ocean of incoherent madness. The solution was obvious. I had to go to the only reliable source I knew. Twitter. We all know there's been a million issues with audio over the years, and I'd be getting into the specifics of what each of those are. But what was a bit more controversial and what I suspected would be more insightful was to ask the community to provide their anecdotes examples and clips of audio issues that they specifically attributed to Steam Audio. Combining all of this feedback alongside a survey I did of over 2,000 people in the Tarkov community about their audio setups. I have what I believe to be a solid foundation to start this discussion. 
Let's begin with what's single-handedly the most common issue that people complain about. If someone is coming from my side, they basically can come all the way close to me and it just kill me. And then I see them in that, you know, that scene, like when I'm about to die, falling down, I see them to my right. And I'm like, wait, what? What just happened? Missing footsteps, ghost scavs, ninja movement, silent enemies. There's a lot of names people use for what's ultimately the same few sets of issues. Have no fear, I have what I'm fairly confident is the handful of explanations for how and why all of these things happen. In order to understand the most common culprits, we need to first understand how Tarkov's audio system is built and how it works. Let's start from the foundation of the audio system, Unity, the game engine that Tarkov's built on. First, we have ambient audio, which are the elements including everything having to do with environmental audio like wind, rain, the hum of the underground ventilation system, the buzz of fluorescent lighting, stuff like that. This is the first audio element that's handled primarily by Unity. Although it does have to be said that despite being handled by Unity, most of the properties and defining characteristics of how the ambient audio works are specified by BSG themselves. Now here's where we encounter the first idiosyncrasy of Tarkov's audio, how it handles transitioning between different areas of the map, such as going between indoors and outdoors, as well as moving between different indoor zones, like when you go underground on reserve. In order to make the transitions between different ambient soundscapes more realistic and immersive, you typically want to try to subtly mix them. Although in the case of Tarkov, it doesn't really do that very well. Especially if you're paying attention to more of the subtle details, like maybe the window that you're sitting next to gets shot out. One might naturally expect to be able to hear some sort of mixture of both indoor and outdoor ambience at this point, but unfortunately, we don't have that yet. Next, we have attenuation, which relates to how sound travels through different mediums like air or water, with their constituent waves losing more and more energy the longer they travel resulting in further sounds generally being quieter and seemingly more muffled as compared to closer sounds. Reflection, and for simplicity's sake reverberation as well, is how sound waves bounce off of different materials, change their direction, altering their sounds, and this also includes the much more complicated interaction they have with other sound waves and materials in the environment as they travel and interact with each other. So, here we have the primary audio features that are configured by BSG, but almost entirely handled within the Unity engine itself. Let's move on to the first major special case, one layer higher up in the chain, and here's where you're going to want to pay close attention. This is likely the single most important aspect of this video that will answer most of your questions about sound in Tarkov. Now, caveat emptor, I cannot speak to why the decision was made to do this in the first place, why it was done the specific way it was done, if there were better alternatives, what sorts of benefits there were to this, none of that. I know lots of folks will be asking all that stuff in the comments, but I obviously can't answer any of them. This aspect of the audio system is a custom-built solution created largely from scratch in-house at BSG to handle the final major aspect of video game sound, known as occlusion. Occlusion is what happens when there exists something in the environment that's directly between the sound source and the listener. Typically, the end result is that an occluded sound is both lower in total volume as well as usually having their higher frequency elements cut off, simulating something that I'll be getting to a little bit later known as transmission. Now, for the most part in video games, sound occlusion goes hand in hand with visual obstruction. You can see an over-exaggerated example of this inside of a little Unity demo project I've been working with to learn a little bit more about this stuff myself. As you can see, as my line of sight to the very center of this sphere that's responsible for emitting this sound, is obstructed by this wall here, the volume and frequency of that sound is cut drastically. Now we experience this kind of occlusion all over the place in Tarkov, just like this. Monka. Where things get a little bit interesting and 
problematic are some of the more complicated environments that require a bit more effort than something like my little demo to produce the desired effect. Let's use this little mock-up I made of the three-story factory office area for an example. Imagine we can represent this entire area inside of one big rectangular prism. This three-dimensional space can be subdivided into a few different sections. Let's just refer to them as zones. And let's say we'll make three different zones, one for each floor of this building. We can then use the boundaries between these zones to replicate audio occlusion. Whenever a sound is going to be emitted, we can draw a line from the source of the sound to the listener. And if this line intersects one of those boundaries, we can apply our occlusion processing to it, making it quieter and muffled. Additionally, we can apply even more occlusion processing to sounds that happen more than one zone away, indicated by that connecting line intersecting two or more boundaries, making the sounds even more quieter and even more muffled. Now, this is a relatively simple solution that, at least in cases like this, works good enough. Now, anyone who's played Factory will know that these aren't three completely disjointed areas. The three floors are all connected at each end by a stairwell. Now, using this simple solution, we end up confronted with a few challenges and considerations. We're going to want the stairwells to have some amount of occlusion, as there are floors and steps in between that will, of course, alter the sound. But we'd also want to try and replicate the effect of the sound reverberating up the column that is the stairwell. In order to replicate some of these aspects, we're going to need to take this implementation a step further, adding more zones not only for each of the stairwells, but also for each level of the stairs as well. In order to achieve the desired result where the actual floors and stairs block at least some amount of sound, we end up making a huge compromise to the experience because of the nature of this implementation. If you're at the top of the staircase looking down, rather than hear approaching steps coming up the stairs gradually increasing in volume, you end up with hearing almost nothing towards the bottom, and even though you have a direct line of sight to someone only a few feet below you on the second level, the sound is muffled as if there was a solid floor between you and them. Even my little diagram here doesn't quite accurately encapsulate all of the weird behaviors that these different zones end up resulting in in terms of gameplay. Let me just play a few examples for you that give you what I would argue is not very good sound. Like, I can even hear him right here where I'm sitting. Yeah. Hold on, do it again, Fluvin, real quick. Right. I can't. I can barely hear him right here compared to right here. Nevertheless, there is a fundamental problem with stairs in Tarkov, and the same exact issue affects sound between floors as well in many cases. If you're prone in dorms, you can hear below you. I know it sounds really fucking weird, but if you're on the third floor, you can't hear anyone below you. But if you're prone, you can hear everything that's going on below you. So it just, it, it, it's just hard, dude. It's just... Now, what Glorious just said makes perfect sense if we understand the implementation. It's very likely that the occlusion geometries between the levels on dorms do not perfectly match up with the visible floor and ceiling geometries. It's unclear if this is intentional or not, as well as if the zones are misaligned or simply larger than they're supposed to be. But if we imagine they extend some amount into the rooms or hallways above or below, we should be able to hear sounds unoccluded on other levels while we're prone close to the floor or standing on something like a table putting us closer to the ceiling. Like this. Yeah, I heard almost nothing. Let me... Oh my god, yeah, Jesus. by prone I can hear it clearly. Alright. 
Wow. As soon as, uh, during, when you were under me, I could hear you clearly until you got under me and then it was completely silent. And then all of a sudden I can hear you like five feet to my right. But like for, there's like a, a cube where if you're like within 10 feet to my left or my right, I can't hear anything. Now, one last really good example of this weird behavior that I want to show you is inside of Big Red on customs. Who knows if this is a unique implementation for these stairs specifically, or if it's how all or some of the metal stairs work. I haven't had a chance to test all of the others, but clearly there's some really weird and misleading audio here. Now I can think of a few different ways this could manifest. Maybe it has some weird shaped zones dividing the stairs and occlusion logic gets wacky here, or maybe they just have simple two dimensional planes as occlusion boundaries like this. So the sound flip flops back and forth between clear and unoccluded for each individual flight of stairs. Now the final example is at the top of these stairs along the metal walkway flanking the office area. This whole area, including the walkway outside of the office, appears to be one big occlusion zone, resulting in this. It goes without saying that inside of a big open metal building, someone running close to you, even a few feet above, on a non-solid platform with only a small railing between you and them, the sound should be quite loud with likely a ton of reverberation inside of the building. Again, I'm not sure if this is desired in some way or if this is some other trade-off I'm unaware of or if it's just an oversight, but it's clearly pretty busted. Now, a bunch of these examples have been compiled and sent to Nikita, who promptly forwarded it to the dev team to triage. When I made my initial call to action on Twitter asking the community to provide me examples of bugs they believe to have been caused by Steam Audio, I received a ton of anecdotes and stories, but unfortunately nothing that was really actionable. Now I pressed more folks to provide some video evidence, but unfortunately the vast majority never sent me any. Now the clips that I did get sent with reported audio issues could pretty much be explained by the same usual suspects that we're all familiar with by now. I saw countless issues with different floors and imprecise occlusion between them. I saw issues related to different indoor and outdoor zones. <sighs> I saw a million flavors of the same staircase issue. Oh! How oh, did they? Oh, yeah. They did. Are you flashlight the glass and fucking? All right, yeah. so you stand at the top. Wait, I can hear you. Yeah. Walk around. You do. You walk around. All right, do it. Come up. Like walk up. Okay, so like when you're right here, you sound like you're not on wood, okay? Like here, stand at the top and I'll run up. What? Well, you try it again. Just run up. Just run up. Just run up. You're running on nothing. Please answer. Hello. Okay, there is a guy in there. Hello, bro. You sound like you're not in red. You sound like you're in the wall. Where? Where did you come from? Redsters. And he even had a few sprinkled in there that had nothing to do with audio at all. Sometimes there were just folks confused about a particular situation and they blamed audio for it. Like this clip where the player didn't realize he was in the middle of a long-range firefight between two suppressed guns, and for some reason he assumed that there was only one person even though at the end of the clip you can hear the two fighting and even hear one of them being hit by a shot. Now let's go back to my little visual here. 
the observant amongst you might have noticed that there's nothing about Steam Audio here yet. Don't worry, we'll get there shortly, although that's kind of the point so far. We haven't gotten to what Steam Audio does when it's enabled, but we've already accounted for a massive number of the complaints that folks have about the audio. Although, do we really know that for sure? Why is it then that so many claim that they experience issues when Steam Audio is on and they don't when it's off? Are they all wrong? The first thing I asked is that you keep in mind that toggling Steam Audio on or off requires a full game restart, which makes the testing process a giant f***ing nightmare, something the average person is never going to actually do. Now consider the millions of situations that you're going to find yourself in while playing Tarkov, no two situations ever being the same. Is it remotely fair to compare two different scenarios across two different raids, sometimes on different days, different maps or areas within the same map, with different gear, and conclude that the relevant variable causing the problem was the audio setting you toggled sometime in the past, even if the issue is audio related? This is the equivalent of getting your tires rotated and the next day you get into a fender bender. You might blame the accident on your tires having been rotated, and that might make sense to some people as a plausible explanation. I mean, the reason why you got into this accident was basically because of your traction, right? But how can you possibly know that it was the reason for the crash? The number of variables involved is way more than you think. Imagine you then go back to the shop and have your tires put back where they originally were. And when you don't get into an accident the next day, you use that as proof that your hypothesis was correct. How can you be really sure that in two different raids, you were wearing the same helmet, the same headphones, had the same exact environmental conditions, you were standing in the same exact spot on the map, and the same source of the sound was made from the same location. Not to mention the fact that there were no updates to the game that might have changed something related to sound, and in one case you had Steam Audio on, and the other you had it off. There's effectively no chance that this would ever happen, and I would contend that those are the required conditions to be able to be confident about one experience being different because of binaural sound. Now that we understand pretty clearly what are the likely causes for most of the issues we've discussed so far, and we also understand where in the audio system these problems were likely to have arisen, Occam's Razor basically tells us that there's no need to introduce additional assumptions into our hypothesis to try to explain what might be going on. Now, am I saying it's impossible that Steam Audio is somehow to blame? Of course not. And luckily, we can, like, test that theory. The first thing we can do is the thing I've never actually seen anybody else do. Replicate as close as possible to identical situations with binaural sound on versus off and compare the outcome. We want to try and do a test where we control as many variables as possible so that we can isolate if one specific variable is relevant or not. I dedicated a few hours across multiple days along with a couple of my mods, thank you Skillet and Fluven, who agreed to help test it live on stream. If the results had shown there was actually a difference, it would have been pretty damning for what's been my public thesis for over a year now, and I would have had to go back to the drawing board. Let's compare the behavior of some of these problematic areas with binaural sound on versus off.
It seems pretty clear to me that while some of these comparisons do sound different due to binaural processing, the ultimate outcome in terms of how audible the relevant sounds are due to occlusion is effectively identical. Again, this supports the idea that Steam Audio as it exists today has no effect on the audibility of sounds in well-known problematic areas like dorms, resort, or factory stairs and different floors. Now, there are a few things that community members have said offhand or mentioned to me directly at different times through our researching for this video that are relevant here. I'm not necessarily Steam Audio. No, no, it's not Steam Audio. Back in the days, there was one thing we were crying about, the whole community, Staircase Audio. Everybody knows that, right? But since Steam Audio got implemented, everybody cries about the audio, audio, like in general audio, audio there, audio here, audio there. But back in the days, it was just Staircase Audio and we, we, we were used to it. You know, we, we we just like, yeah, OK, they were never going to fix it. We just going to play the game like that. Now, this is a sentiment that I've heard a few different variations of from a number of folks in the community. And although it's never explicitly said, there seems to be a number of potentially unstated premises here underlying many of these discussions. Now, I don't want to put words in anybody's mouth, but I do want to point out that the way in which many folks talk about this topic really does seem to hint that they may be under certain impressions, which could also potentially lead folks in the community that happen to be listening to have these impressions as well. Almost all of the following issues I'm going to be discussing are caused in part or in full by how everything related to Steam Audio was communicated to the community from BSG as well as within the community itself. During the months leading up to its addition to the game, Nikita, and basically the whole community at large, had almost exclusively referred to this upcoming change to Tarkov's audio as Steam Audio. But unless you fully read the patch notes, or watched a video from a content creator that accurately explained what it was, there's a lot that you actually wouldn't know about it, as well as there being a ton that you might assume that might not be true. The first common misconception is that when this patch hit, Steam Audio was in the game. It was now a fundamental aspect of all of Tarkov's audio. There was nothing you could do about it. Lots of folks simply had no idea that not only was this iteration of Steam Audio a tiny piece of a much larger and longer term change, but first, it was only accessible in the game through the audio option, not called Steam Audio as they might have expected, but instead was called Binaural Sound a phrase that few people understood or knew had anything to do with Steam Audio, but also that the setting defaulted to off for everybody since day one. The number of people who never touched this setting and still blamed Steam Audio for all of their sound issues is by itself pretty damning evidence that way too many people unfairly blame it for so many of their problems. Now the next common misconception is that Tarkov contains two entirely different audio systems, the old Tarkov audio system and Steam Audio. It's believed that when you toggle binaural sound on and restart the game, that you're switching from system A to system B. So of course it would logically follow that any and all issues you experience while you were using Steam Audio were caused by Steam Audio. This new system was the system that was in charge of everything related to sound. Now this is of course not the case, but I'll be getting more into the details on that later. Now the final misconception was that Steam Audio being introduced into the game had to have had some effect on the game's audio, whether you had the setting on or off, as if it was still actively doing some latent audio processing regardless of your setting. Now while this is theoretically possible, although I've never seen any direct evidence of it, part of this reasoning appears to come from folks who have binaural sound off, but they notice when they watch a bunch of back in the day gameplay that it sounds different and attribute it to the one change they happen to think of, Steam Audio. That's only because we, yeah, of course, that's, but even as, a, as an old player, I feel like the audio has not improved at all. It has not only gotten worse since, since implementation of Steam Audio, the second implementation. Maybe it's the same. Maybe it's just Steam Audio causing issues on the, on the audio. Like, I feel like I have issues with both. Like, I can't, like, I have issues with on and with off. Why then, though, it got, it was kind of fine back in the days. And since the second implementation of Steam Audio, it got, like, totally ruined. This seems to me to be one of those examples of confusing correlation and causation. Drawing conclusions about a direct causal relationship between two things based solely on their being coincidental. This is the same kind of reasoning that allows us to conclude that somehow the per capita consumption of margarine in the entire U.S. is connected to the divorce rate in Maine, or how the number of new films that Nicolas Cage stars in must be causing more people to drown after falling into swimming pools. The point here is that there's a difference between observing a coincidental correlation between two factors versus establishing a direct causal connection between them. It's important to remember just how many other changes, additions, bug fixes, and more related to game audio they've done over the years, both before and after Steam Audio was introduced. 
do a search of Tarkov's changelog, which only includes a portion of the actual changes they've done over the years for things like sound, audio, silent, stuff like that, and you'll find more than 100 references. Look at all the changes done in 2017, 2018, 2019, the first part of 2020 before Steam Audio was introduced, and then after. While some of these issues were related to Steam Audio, the vast majority are clearly not. Now, all of these changes are relevant when comparing two different auditory experiences over large periods of time, and any of them has the potential to introduce all kinds of sound-related problems. Once again, there's a million moving parts along the way here, and it's just too easy to point to the one boogeyman that is Steam Audio without having solid evidence backing it up. I'm hoping that you're beginning to see a bit of a common theme here. Now, what's worse is that we get clips like this one. Yo, Veritas, what's your favorite headset, man? Don't call me with Zor Sordings, please. No, come on, man. Come on, man. <laughs> I mean, of course it goes without saying that people who have opinions like this should be completely discredited and cannot be trusted. Now, as many long-term veterans of Tarkov with fairly decent memories will tell you, almost all of the issues that people are complaining about now, most of which they're blaming on Steam Audio, have been in the game in one form or another as long as we can remember. You don't need to take my word for it either. As discussed earlier, Steam Audio was introduced in the game in early 2020. It doesn't take much digging to find an endless supply of audio issues indistinguishable from so many of the issues that we face today being reported years before Steam Audio was ever added to the game. Yes. Ha! Now I can protect you. What the? No, Tarkov, no, that's not how it's supposed to work. I'm sorry, but no. Er hat Hit, er ist hinten hinter den Schrottteilen. Ja, dann kannst du ihn einfach zuspammen mit Granaten. Ey! Granatenglitch, Granatenglitch, wir beide sind tot. Ah. Oh nee, ernsthaft hier? what about all of the other instances where people don't mention stairs or different floors at all? They swear they weren't involved. Well, before we take a look at most of the specific examples that I've been sent, we need to talk a little bit about another infamous boogeyman. The D word. But yeah. Dude, I've never seen that before. Oh my god, dude. I was hanging out in Mark's stream the other day and we were chatting about audio issues and he had an interesting take that nobody else had mentioned before. 
audio is like directly tied to RTT IMO. Um, just this is all personal experience, anecdotal bullshit, but this is my bro science. It's all like based on RTT. If the RTT is giga high, then that person's audio is not going to reach you before you're dead. Like a lot of the time in CQC situations, right? So binaural was on. It was dog shit. I turned it off and was like, wow, yeah, it's still fucking dog shit. This has nothing to do with whether it's binaural or not. So I put binaural back on. At the end of the day, I think it is, it, it's literally, um, is the server good or is the server bad, right? That's it. Is the server good or is the server bad? That's it. And I think like people's lack of understanding of that is, uh, is what makes them form an opinion on whether or not they want to use binaural when I don't think it has to do with it whatsoever. Interesting. So what do servers have to do with sound? How could they be related? Well, when it comes to things like desync, there are countless examples that make it clear that it's much more complicated than most think and helps to shed light on just how intertwined audio is with so many of the other important systems in the game. Maybe you've seen something like this. Do you know the extract behind the telephone pole? Like where it's your left, I think. Ah! Oh yeah. shit. What just hit? What? Something just Did hit, hit you. Me. Something hit me. Oops. Game's lagging hardcore. Oh, I got yeah. hit again. Ah. Oh, yeah, I'm dying. He's, ah. he's got to be Don't out in the woods. There. Run, run. Pop, um... I think he's doing? in the woods out there, dude. He can't be out there. Well, that's where he just hit me from. I was just sitting in this little corner next to the tractor. No, I think he's over here, brother. You think he's over here? I don't think he had an angle oh, on me from over lagging? here. I'm getting hit still. I'm getting hit. Oh, I'm getting hit. There's something. I don't know. This is fishy. Can we just extract? Oh, I think he might be in the woods over there. In my experience, the most common gut reaction that it seems that most folks in the community jump to when they encounter this sort of thing is cheaters. But that doesn't seem to be the case in most of the clips I've seen. Now in that last clip, Stone Mountain's teammate even says, did it hit you? As if he actually heard a gunshot. What? Some just hit, hit you. And then shortly after said this. Game's lagging hardcore. And again, a few more times throughout the clip, his teammate says some things that gives me reason to believe that he was actually hearing the sounds when clearly Stone Mountain wasn't. He's gotta be Don't out in the woods. There. Run, run. No, I think he's over here, brother. And if you've seen my previous episode about Tarkov netcode, you're going to recognize a ton of telltale signs related to server or networking related issues. There's countless examples where even teammates are invisible for all or some of their teammates for a portion or even an entire raid, even when they can see you perfectly fine or vice versa. I'm here, I'm here. Uh, oh my, what? You were, <gasps> you were invisible! What? What the fuck? Oh, bro! Ah! What the fuck? What? He's not even making... The vast majority of the time, this issue appears most commonly with NPC scabs. Uh. Huh. Yeah, ah! This car? He's right here. That's him right there. Where? You don't see him? No. Uh. Oh, I'm, I'm dead. Desync is a word that everyone throws around, but it's clear that very few people actually understand conceptually what it is. It's not just synonymous with lag or peaker's advantage. It's not just an issue that manifests in movement issues or shitty hit registration. At its core, it's about consistency of information. Things like the state of the raid and events that are happening within it, between the server and each of the clients. Synchronization. The term synchronization is something like 400 years old and originally meant simply to occur at the same time. Now in the 20th century, the shortened form of sync would be added to our lexicon and along with it, some additional ideas or concepts related to harmony or agreement. 
Now we could describe two or more discrete entities that work together well due to aspects like timing as well as consistency as being synced. In the context of online video games, synchronization is most relevant to the state of all of the aspects of the game, such as the positions and actions of the players and NPCs being as close as possible to identical at any given time between every one of the clients as well as the server. When a client becomes desynchronized from the server, whether that's an issue with the server itself or a connection issue on your end or somebody else within the raid, your client can only represent the information it has, which is more often than not out of date, a snapshot of some past state frozen in time. When it comes to the kinds of information that need to be synced, it turns out there's all sorts. There's things like state information about a character's stance and current animation like running versus walking, positional information like your location in the environment, event-based information relevant to visual and auditory things such as gunshots for sounds and muzzle flash, reloads, flashbangs popping nearby, voice lines and things like doors being opened or not, as well as ballistics information related to things like bullet trajectories, hit registration, damage updates to armor and damage and injuries to parts of your body. Many of these pieces of information are dependent on each other in one or more ways, while many are entirely independent from the perspective of the client and the server, despite how counterintuitive it might seem. More importantly to the context of this discussion, most of them involve one or more corresponding sounds, but not in the same way we might be used to from real life. When a gun is fired in real life, you're hearing a pressure wave that has traveled through the air that has originated from the barrel of a gun due to a small explosion inside of the chamber as a result of gunpowder inside of a bullet being ignited by a spark created when its primer is struck by the firing pin due to a trigger being pulled. This is a chain of events that's ultimately all down to physics and chemistry, direct cause and effect. It's all deterministic, at least at a macro scale. Please don't go there. In a video game, when you click mouse one while pointing at an enemy, the game should fire the gun and the enemy should die. Now this is a multi-step process that involves countless entities with numerous software subsystems all doing a bunch of different things properly, all at the same time. What I'm gonna show you is both way more complicated than likely many of you have thought, while also being a gross oversimplification. Bear with me here, I won't be getting too technical, and understanding this stuff, even at a high level, will hopefully give you a totally new perspective on video games, as well as some of the bugs you encounter. First, the game's code is supposed to take this mouse click input as a request that you'd like to do something. Some sort of character controller is going to be fed that request, determine that you currently have a gun equipped, meaning that you likely want to fire it, which requires checks ensuring that your character is ready and able to shoot, that the gun is loaded and free from malfunctions, as well as establish its position and orientation in the world so that aim can be resolved. Then your client needs to represent this gunshot to you. Some sort of animation system needs to be informed of that gunshot and visually represent everything like the bullet leaving the barrel, the spent casing being ejected from the gun, the muzzle flash, and the movement of the various mechanical elements of the process like the slide. Your character controller needs to handle the recoil of the weapon as it alters the player's perspective by manipulating the camera according to parameters like the gun, the ammo, and the physical state of the player like injuries and stance. The sound engine then needs to determine what the corresponding sound for that bullet is, locate the file it downloaded previously that corresponds with the bullet and the gun with the modifications you have attached to it, like compensators or suppressors, process that sound based on your environment such as adding reverb in a closed underground space, and handling echoes off of a distant mountainside, also taking into consideration things like what helmet or headset you're wearing, what your character's state is, like if you've recently been concussed, your ears are ringing from a flashbang, or you're experiencing side effects from something like a stimulant. It then needs to pass that audio information up along the way until it's ultimately played through your headphones. Then, a bunch of information related to that gunshot needs to be passed to some sort of networking subsystem that's responsible for converting it all into a previously agreed upon format between the client and server, bundled up into a neat little data package and sent from the game client up to some networking layer in your operating system, which is then sent over the wire to your router, over the wires of your ISP, likely into some other wires your ISP doesn't control, ultimately hitting the internal network of the Tarkov server in a warehouse somewhere into the appropriate machine and operating system running an instance of Tarkov server code. Now in the meantime, your client has already begun firing the gun and animating the whole process, playing the appropriate sound, and has done many of the calculations regarding where the bullet will land based on the internal ballistics implementation. It might have even shown the bullet hitting the target where it anticipates it would, displaying the appropriate impact animations, blood splatters, and playing the associated sound effects like the enemy moaning in pain. 
As of right now, the game has communicated the information that you hit your target, both visually and audibly, in a quite convincing and seemingly confident way, but in reality, your client has really only come up with its best guess, a kind of prediction based on some assumptions for what happened based on the information it had at the time. At some point shortly after you clicked mouse one, the server has decoded and unpacked the data. It needs to pass it along to one or more of its subsystems to do things like validate all of the information is legitimate and accurate, that you were roughly where the server thought you were last, that you're requesting to fire a gun that you actually have with ammo that it confirms you had previously loaded, then it needs to calculate things like ballistic trajectories and handle the impact of the bullet on the target, hopefully coming as close as possible to the same conclusion as your client did. The server then needs to do the required calculations related to penetration and fragmentation that ultimately result in things like numbers for calculated armor damage, flesh damage, and information about injuries and more, which is all then packaged back up and sent back out to every single client in that raid that needs to be told about the status update. Now, once the state information has made its way back to your client, assuming everything went perfectly each step along the way, your client will receive an acknowledgement of that impact, that your target has been hit and they have died, at which point all of the relevant death animations and sounds will be played and you can rejoice in your victory. Now, eventually, the same information will have made it to all of the other clients on that server, most importantly, the client of the unfortunate target. They'll be receiving the information about the bullet being fired, showing the relevant animations and playing the relevant sounds, and then they'll receive the information about the subsequent impact and damage. Their client is gonna to need to handle all of the corresponding animations and sounds, representing aim punch, updating the UI with damage, health and injury related info, updating armor values, and everything related to their character dying. Now this all assumes there's no major bugs in the client code or the server code causing any issues anywhere along the way. It all assumes that every piece of information gets where it needs to go in a reasonable amount of time from each client to the server and back with all of the different operating systems, routers, and ISP infrastructure in between, and everything that comes with it. I got third partied! Oh, you so God. Now this complexity isn't a Tarkov thing, it's just a fundamental nature of multiplayer games. Explained in this context, it naturally feels like a f***ing miracle that any of this stuff works, ever. And it's not too surprising to realize why it doesn't every now and then. Not long ago, Eroctic came out with a video where he exposed a bug that he tied to Flechette and the double barrel shotgun. The conclusion that he came to, largely influenced by the spurious opinions from an ex-Tarkov cheat developer, was that what we were seeing was likely something server-side that was refusing the damage as the result of some change intentionally made by BSG in response to some cheaters who allegedly had some cheat that could alter the penetration chance of, quote, shitty bullets. Now, while I commend his willingness to take the time to test this out, the way he conducted the tests and the conclusions that he came to at the end left a bit to be desired, at least for me. Not to mention that the conclusion he came to based on the cheater's hunch seemed to be one of those instances where a hammer sees everything as a nail. It's unsurprising how common it is that some issues appear to be related to one thing when they might in fact be caused by something entirely different. After painting the walls of factory with the brains of countless willing test subjects from my community, the tentative conclusion that I came to and subsequently sent to Nikita was that it was, you guessed it, a synchronization issue. It didn't appear to be related to hit registration or ballistics at all, and I was also able to demonstrate that it wasn't limited to the double barrel shotgun and it had nothing to do with the type or class of armor you were wearing. The most obvious sign that synchronization issues were the cause was that pretty much any time I shot the test subjects and they didn't die, neither the target nor literally any of the other people who were in the lobby with us even saw or heard me fire the gun. And what was more interesting was when I would reload the gun, that wasn't visible to them either. Hmm, perhaps a clue. Now after testing a few other theories out, swapping guns and ammo a bunch of times, I began to notice that every now and then I'd move a stack of ammo around my inventory, maybe split the stack into smaller ones, and sometimes I'd notice that I would have slots in my pockets or my rig that appeared to be glitched out. I'd be unable to put anything into them. Now at the same time, I would also be unable to reload my gun in a few of the alternate ways in which you can reload, 
such as opening your inventory and dragging a stack of ammo onto any guns that you can normally handload that way. And while I was unable to do a few of these different forms of reloads, if I left my inventory and simply hit R, I would be able to reload, although this would always result in nobody seeing the reload, nobody seeing the subsequent shot, and the shot appearing to be a dud. Now it was clear that due to some unknown issue that appeared to have a few potential causes, I'd likely be unable to properly debug, that there was some combination of guns, ammo stacks, and or inventory slots that would get bugged out. And of course, I can't pinpoint which of these elements were the cause and which were the result of this weird behavior, but clearly some interaction somewhere between the three would put you in a state where you were loading potentially bugged ammo from bug slots into a bugged gun. It seems highly likely that the result was that the data you sent to the server was malformed in some way, so it was never actually sent to the server, or maybe it included null or invalid values for parameters leading to the server rejecting them. Either way, this seemed entirely consistent with the type of issue that would lead to the server not processing those actions, which means it wouldn't get propagated to every other client in that raid, hence nobody seeing you do any of the things that you were doing related to this bug state, such as shooting or reloading. Now, interestingly enough, Eroctic did notice and point out the lack of muzzle flash or aim punch from the test subject being shot, but what he would have noticed if he was aware of these sorts of things to look out for when conducting effective tests or perhaps had he paid a little more attention, was the lack of synchronization between the clients during the reload process. Had he noticed this, it would have seriously called into question the whole hypothesis that it was related to some sort of hit registration or some anti-exploit measure explicitly designed by BSG. Now, of course, I can't be so sure that my hypothesis is correct. Maybe Eroctic's ex-cheater friend's theory is right. Maybe there's an even more bizarre explanation and we're both wrong. Who knows? I do feel like it's worth mentioning, though, the differences in testing and analysis, as well as I think it's worth pointing out the differences in how this information is communicated. Of course, not everyone has direct communication with Nikita, and there are other circumstances here that may or may not be relevant that we don't need to get into. That's not really the point. I heard about an issue, I did my tests, and I shared the results with Nikita, passing along notes about all of the relevant observations I had, outlining specific steps to reproduce the issue, and shared my ultimate theory and justifications as to why that might be the cause. If you don't happen to have a direct line to Nikita, compiling the clips and doing a short write-up on Reddit or the forums like I had sent to Nikita can still go a very long way. Something tells me that this kind of approach is going to be more successful at effectively communicating the issue, pointing the devs in the right direction when it comes to diagnosing it, and ultimately getting the issue resolved, as compared to this kind of approach. The louder you spread this message, faster Nikita will fix all of the bullets, okay? Nikita, if you're watching, give me my drops, dipshit. Now again, the reason why I bring this up is to showcase a clear example where some bizarre, unexpected thing in the game can easily be attributed to any number of likely unrelated causes, especially if you don't have the proper context, background knowledge, or do a proper investigation. It also serves as an example of how this misinformation and confusion can propagate throughout the community, kind of like this. You know, about the double barrel bug. Here we go. What's the double barrel bug? I think Veritas did some testing and, and debunked it if I wasn't, wasn't mistaken. Said it's all client side. Bro. I have had no issues this white killing people with a double barrel. It's too much damage and the server won't register it is what they are saying. So at some point a video comes out that popularizes a real issue but comes to an entirely wrong conclusion. That information spreads throughout the community in YouTube videos, comment sections, the subreddit, the forums, and then across Twitch chats like mine. I then do some testing on stream confirming the problem, but come up with what appears to be a much more plausible root cause explanation. I even tweet the details out. Then sometime over the next three weeks, more wrong information spreads around the community, eventually making it to Pestily, who innocently mentions in a side comment in a video that will very likely get more views than this video itself, that I debunked something that I actually confirmed. The way Pestily worded it was actually quite ambiguous. He said I debunked the double barrel bug and that it ended up being all client side, but like, what does that mean? Technically, I debunked it and technically the issue is likely a client side issue, but the way that I initially interpreted what he said and clearly the way that many commenters understood it was that I debunked that there was any issue at all. There's clearly a non-zero number of people that watch this video and taking Pestily's summary of my testing is going to spread around that information even more potentially even leading to me losing credibility in the eyes of those people who know that the bug is actually real and now think that I claimed it wasn't, despite the fact that they're all pretty much parroting the same misinformation from Eroctic's video. Now, as a quick update to this story, after most of this video had already been edited, it would seem that BSG has reported that they fixed the issue. 
Now, I haven't yet had a chance to test it myself, but over the last few days, I haven't heard anyone experiencing it anymore, so that's good news. What was even better news was that I was able to confirm with Nikita that my original suspicion was accurate. The issue had nothing to do with damage, hit reg, dealing with cheaters, the double barrel, or flechette ammo specifically. It was an inventory-related bug that led to desync between the server and all the clients. Feels good to have a confirmation that my conclusion was correct. Dude, for the RFB. And the other guy fired all his bullets. Blew his whole load. Oh! Let's dive into arguably the most important aspect of first-person shooter video game audio, the major practical element that will make or break players' opinions of and trust in the game, localization, or the ability to successfully locate sounds, identifying their origin, determining distance and direction in a 3D space. Lots of games do this better than others, but there seems to be a huge divide within the Tarkov community about how well it actually works, and while I know I'm not going to settle this debate once and for all in this video, I think I'll be able to provide a lot more context and maybe even change a few minds. Now Tarkov currently only supports stereo audio, which is a single left and a single right channel. The direction of that audio can be inferred based on the relative volumes of the same sound heard in each ear, with the sound directly to your left typically being significantly louder in your left ear compared to your right, whereas something in front of you just slightly to your right will result in that sound being only slightly louder in the right ear as compared to the left. Now, when dealing with equally distant audio above, below, in front, or behind, the volume of the sound is going to be evenly balanced between the left and right channels, which can, of course, lead to some confusion and ambiguity. Now, many of us over the years have learned to be able to distinguish sounds coming from the front versus the rear by simply turning our character in the game left or right and paying attention to the direction that the sound moves relative to us. Map knowledge and experience are pretty much the primary contributing factors that allows us to tell the difference between in front, in the back, above, and below. As knowing things like what materials or surfaces are in the relative location of the sound, or what areas have floors below or above, can help you deduce where that sound is coming from. Now ignoring context clues and heuristics like turning your head, using purely audio alone, there really isn't that much that the game is going to be able to do to provide a natural or intuitive distinction between audio that originates above, below, behind, and in front without some sort of additional processing. So what about all the different technologies that I hear people talking about? All kinds of different hardware audio systems and software technologies? What are they and do they actually work? We already know that stereo sound involves two channels, a left and a right. But let's take this to the next level and look at 5.1 surround. What does that mean and how does it work? The 5 in this case refers to five distinct channels, with the point 0.1 indicating a low-end channel such as a subwoofer. If a movie supports 5.1, that means the movie is outputting five different channels of audio, one in the center, one channel each for left and right, and then another pair of channels that are representing the sides. The positioning of these speakers in your environment relative to where you're going to be listening and how each of the sounds are sent to each provide all the auditory context you need for three-dimensional sound. A 7.1 surround takes this a step further with, you guessed it, two more channels. Instead of having a pair of channels that represent the side and rear together, those are split into four channels, giving you two surround channels and two rear channels. This provides even more auditory resolution for more precise and immersive audio. 5.1 and 7.1 surround systems are what's known as true surround, because they literally surround the listener. But what about virtual surround? What's that? Let's start by looking at one of the most popular, Dolby Atmos. A Dolby Atmos is different from the true surround options discussed in that it doesn't use channels. Under the covers, all of the sound data is represented using coordinates in 3D space, kind of like how graphics are represented inside of a game engine. Now, if you're at a movie theater or a home theater that supports Atmos, you'll likely see a bunch of speakers all around you, including above you on the ceiling. As the sound moves through the virtual environment, its 3D position is translated into which speaker or speakers should be playing that sound at what time and at what volume. 
Now this can provide an even more immersive experience than true surround, with much finer detail and control over the position of sounds in the physical environment of the listener. Finally, let's talk about the other more popular virtual surround technology, Windows Sonic. Windows Sonic is designed to convert surround sound information like 5.1, 7.1, and even Dolby Atmos into just two stereo channels, primarily for use with headphones. Now it does this by taking all of the audio metadata and information from the extra channels and combines that with some technical magic, modifying and combining all of it in such a way that aims to provide better spatial sound for normal stereo headphones. The final thing I'll mention briefly but I'm not going to get into because Linus Tech Tips did a great video on it a few years back is some of the different things like true surround headphones and virtual audio options that come with other gaming headphones and their accompanying software. Check out that video if you're interested in more on that. Well damn, some of these options seem pretty amazing, so which one should we use for Tarkov? My honest recommendation is none. The reason why is a pretty simple one, and that's that for all intents and purposes, none of those technologies can work, at least how you'd expect. They're all fundamentally incompatible with Tarkov and many games out there as well. Now despite that answer being simple, it doesn't really feel like a sufficient one. I struggled with what would be the best way to explain this until I talked to my old man, who gave me the idea to use images as a metaphor, and y'all know I love me a good metaphor, so let's give it a try. Now this guy right here is Tim Hetherington, the late British photojournalist whose work you'd likely be familiar with if you've ever seen Restrepo, a fascinating 2010 documentary about the war in Afghanistan that I would highly recommend. I'm mentioning him because that documentary is worth a plug, and also because I'm going to be using a few of his famous photographs for this metaphor for audio. Imagine this photo was taken with one of those old-timey black-and-white analog cameras. We can take the resulting developed photo and then scan it onto our computer to get a digital version of it. Now given that it's grayscale, each pixel of the image can be represented with a number value between 0 and 255, representing its luminance or where the constituent brightness lies within the range between completely black and completely white. Now as a side note, if you're interested in more image stuff and haven't seen my video on image compression and why Tarkov looks like shit in many live streams and videos, might as well plug that video here too. Even though this image is black and white, we can see a ton of detail and generally have no issues looking at it and determining what we're seeing. For example, it appears that we're looking at some sort of military group out in a desert somewhere, shooting what appears to be a howitzer. Let's use this image to represent our simple two-channel stereo audio. Simply by knowing where and how bright each pixel is, we can recreate this photo, and when we look at it, despite the lack of color, it still effectively communicates quite a lot to us, and there's a ton that we can infer. Now moving on, what we're seeing now is the same photo had it been taken with a slightly more modern analog color film camera, developed and then scanned onto our computer. In this case, it's conceptually similar to surround sound in that it has additional channels including more information about each pixel, its chrominance or color value. We ultimately have the same source image as the black and white example, but we get a lot more information in context with the additional color channels by comparison. Finally, let's take a look at the actual image as it was taken with a modern digital camera. In very much the same way, the additional 3D coordinate data that comes along with Dolby Atmos provides extremely detailed spatial information, even compared to other surround technologies, a photograph taken with a modern digital camera comes along with loads of additional information as well, known as metadata, that we don't get even with the most beautifully detailed full-color analog photo. Some of the metadata we get with digital photos are created automatically by the camera itself, like the camera model and its settings. And information like description, tags, location, and copyright data can later be added by the photographer. Much of this stuff is information only the photographer would know. Important context that might otherwise be lost the moment the image ends up in the hands or on screen of others. Now looking at the metadata for this image, we can see it was taken at Camp Blessing in the Korngal Valley of Afghanistan by Tim Hetherington with a Canon 5D, back in April of 2008, along with all sorts of information about the camera settings at the time, such as the aperture, shutter speed, focal length, exposure, and more. We even have the copyright data and are able to see that the source image was modified on a Mac running Photoshop back in 2012. The metadata also contains keywords like soldier, firearms, mountain, clouds, artillery, and even more abstract ideas such as masculinity and armed conflict. This provides an entirely new level of detail for someone looking at the image and can also have a ton of utility as well, such as allowing the image to more quickly and easily be categorized, stored, and searched for, like on your favorite stock image website or via a Google image search. 
So we know when we look at this photograph and compare the three different representations of the same location and moment in time, the differences in detail of the resulting image, as well as the metadata that comes along with each, can drastically change how much we can know about that image. Sometimes these details or the context is subtle and we might never notice them or even know they exist, but they're nevertheless significant in many ways. Now to summarize this little metaphor up until this point, this is very much the same thing conceptually as hearing the same sound represented in different ways, and these differences can have a huge impact on how we're able to know about the source of that sound, like proximity and location. So back to the original question, why wouldn't we want to use Dolby Atmos or surround sound when it's just clearly better even in the photo metaphor? Well, here's the rub. In this metaphor, Tarkov is the old-timey analog black and white camera. It only supports stereo audio. Trying to use surround sound to represent stereo audio is like watching a black and white television show on a color TV. It's still going to be black and white no matter how good the TV is. Now if we scan the photo, converting it to a digital image and open it up on our computer, our computer is not going to be able to suddenly convert it to a color image and add all of the relevant metadata to it because neither the scanner nor your computer have access to any of that information. In exactly the same way, normal stereo audio from a game played through surround sound software or headphones is not going to be able to represent the original 3D sound as it would have existed inside of the game. Those systems simply don't have that information to work with. But what about technologies like image recognition and artificial colorization? Can they add back details like color or metadata about what's in the image? Doesn't audio have the same sort of thing? Well, firstly, yes, those image technologies do exist and they can enhance the resulting image you see in many ways. But you have to understand that those sort of enhancements are not necessarily representative of the original. Artificial colorization can produce impressively colored images as a result, especially when you combine it with things like deep learning algorithms that use object recognition for additional color context. But there's a big difference between creating a colored image that looks and feels right to being able to recreate an image that's true to the original. Now in many cases you end up with an image where one or more aspects are not quite right when you compare it with the original. Imagine if living or dying in Tarkov relied on some colorization algorithms interpretation of a black and white image and how accurately it was representing the colors of the original. Or imagine relying on some image recognition's outputted list of tags for an image to be able to fully and accurately describe the original when you get such mixed results like this ranging in accuracy from pretty good, not relevant enough to even mention, all the way down to just flat out incorrect. At the end of the day, given the limitations of current technology, it's simply impractical to rely on this sort of image processing if your goal is to be able to confidently and accurately recreate the original. In the realm of audio, comparable types of technology may try to infer contextual or spatial information from the existing audio data in each year, such as the frequency and volume, ultimately altering the output based on some internal heuristics entirely outside of the game like Tarkov. The result is more often than not similar to the image processing we just talked about, audio that is at best ambiguous and confusing and at worst straight up incorrect. This is exactly the reason why Hunt Showdown, a game that both uses Steam Audio and is widely regarded as having some of the best atmospheric and spatial audio in the business, pops up a full screen message seconds after you boot up the game telling players that they should be using stereo audio only for the best 3D audio experience. I'm hoping that that overly elaborate metaphor was able to give you a different, more digestible perspective on why exactly surround technologies are not only not going to help you produce better spatial sound in Tarkov, 
but how in many ways they can make it much worse. I would highly suggest going to your sound settings, finding the playback device that you listen to your game audio through, open up the properties, and head on over to the spatial sound tab and disable everything there. I would also ensure that you don't have any other audio software on your computer, such as software for your headphones that has any spatial sound options enabled. Turn it all off. I've polled the Tarkov community, asking them what sorts of technologies or settings they had for their headphones, and 22% said they had some sort of surround option enabled, and 13% said they didn't even know. Upwards of a third of the community is basically listening to Tarkov sound through the audio equivalent of a Snapchat filter, and then they come to me to complain that the game doesn't sound right. Now here's another update I'm going to be adding here in post after I had already finished editing this part of the video. Last night, the community and I found one more culprit that might be contributing to some of the issues that you guys are experiencing. I had a member of the community come to me telling me about an issue that he was having with audio and sent me this clip. I instantly noticed a few things about this that sounded way off to me. The most obvious things were that the ambient sound was way too quiet, the healing animation seemed super harsh as if the volume was jacked way up but it was being put through a compressor or something, and then some sort of weird phasing or delay issue between the left and right channels was present. What was most interesting to me was how obviously bad this sounded to me, but at the same time a bunch of folks in chat were basically saying that it sounded fine to them, that's how Tarkov always sounded. Now, of course, doing my due diligence, I had to confirm if all of the different surround sounds, spatial audio, and other sound-related programs and settings were all disabled, and they pretty much unanimously confirmed that this was the case. Now, I also need to mention that I confirmed a number of different ways that the YouTube clips, as well as the audio from the stream itself that my viewers were hearing, was all exactly the same as what I was hearing. So that's a variable that we can ignore for now. At this point, I was basically at a complete loss for how so many people could be experiencing such terrible audio, and not only not notice how it sounded different from the audio that I've been having on stream all day for hours before, but also think that what they were hearing from that clip was normal. After replicating the same conditions in my game and recording it, I took the two clips and played them for the stream side by side. Now take note here that my recording is a little bit cleaner, and also while it might not seem like it, these two clips actually have the initial volume of opening up the CMS kit normalized, so they're starting at the same volume. And wouldn't you know it, once they were put into context and compared in a more controlled way, suddenly the differences became much clearer to folks in chat. First, I have to mention how this is just another instance that solidifies the point I made earlier about how it's basically pointless for people to make comparisons between different things unless conditions are controlled and the context is fully known so that you can ensure that the comparisons you're making are fair. Something about this idea in the realm of audio seems, to me at least, very similar to the visual tricks like the Munker's Illusion, where the color or lighting context surrounding multiple discrete areas of color makes them appear to be entirely different colors, when in fact they're exactly the same, something we can demonstrate easily by removing the ambiguous or confusing context from the image, leaving only the relevant shades to compare. In very much the same way that folks might be skeptical of the true answer to those color illusions until they see the actual comparisons shown out of context, most of the people in chat that heard the side-by-side -side comparisons of the two surgery sounds in-game did ultimately come around and recognize there was a difference, even if at the time it was hard to describe or really pinpoint. Now the benefit of this is that once folks were actually convinced that there was a difference when they never noticed it before, 
they're much more willing and motivated to try and find the cause. And lo and behold, minutes after this demonstration, I saw these messages pop up in chat from Indonagan, one of the folks who said that their game sounded exactly like the surgery clip with the weird audio, and they thought it was normal. Now what makes this even better is the next few messages that popped up in chat from Seal, the dude who had sent the original clip we were all just arguing about. Now some folks reported having Sonic Studio 3 running and a bunch of settings enabled related to compression, noise suppression, loudness equalization, and more. And others said that everything appeared to have been off or disabled. But what seemed to be common to just about everybody that turned these settings off, closed this program, or even uninstalled it entirely, was that their sound experience in Tarkov seemed to improve drastically. Now, to be sure this wasn't a fluke or a placebo, I had Seal record some more gameplay with Sonic Studio running, as well as not running. And even with it running, while none of the settings were enabled, there's clearly a difference between the two. Now chalk up one more win for those of us who have been saying look everywhere and turn off all of the external audio shit you have running. Before you blame the game for weird sound, take a few moments to check your Windows audio settings, your headphone software configuration, and see what other programs or services are running that you might not even know exist. I've been saying this for over two years now, and, and everything I said then still holds today. I can't tell you the number of folks that have taken my or others' advice to look for and disable all external sound-related stuff, and then said it massively improved their experience playing Tarkov. If you've had any of these weird audio issues in Tarkov, you might very well be one of them. Okay, time out here. This is another last-minute edit I need to throw in, because I just spent all f day on this one, and I need you all to understand the hell I just went through. I figured that those audio examples I showed you with the CMS kit would be maybe a little too subtle for some folks to really understand, so I decided I needed to actually try out and record my use of some of these different pieces of audio tech. Hell, maybe I'd even have my mind changed. First, I went over to my audio device settings and enabled Windows Sonic for headphones, and booted up my game, went into an offline raid, and literally the moment the countdown started I could already tell something was very wrong. I hope I don't have to explain how terribly scuffed the audio was there. Like, horrible on every conceivable level. That's exactly the thing I wanted to communicate when I was explaining how stereo audio is simply not going to sound good through any sort of 3D spatial processing. So then I disabled Windows Sonic and decided to go ahead and try out Sonic Studio, the piece of software I mentioned earlier that many folks have installed on their machines by default. I installed the companion app, opened it up, and toggled Sonic Studio FX. And naturally, as any gamer would do, I enabled the gaming preset, launched Tarkov, and hopped in another raid for testing. The results? Well, here. Oh, my God. 
Okay, okay, so I had game remote enabled, but maybe I have to go to the advanced settings and tweak it some more. So I tried that and- oh. Well, that's weird, it crashed. Alright, let's just launch it one more time and see- Um, okay, maybe we'll give it one more try Oh. Alright, well I guess on the bright side it's no longer running, right? So let's just hop into another raid and make sure it's off. Okay, um, this can't be, like, how my game is gonna sound from now on, right? Maybe I need to reboot my computer? Yeah. Oh, f It's literally worse. Maybe there's like a background process running? Like, I don't even know what to look for. There's nothing here. What am I gonna do? Maybe I can like uninstall it entirely, right? That'll get my original audio back. Yeah, yeah, let's just go ahead and do that and, and relaunch the game. Oh my god, I'm in hell. This is hell. I literally have one more idea. When I initially opened Sonic Studio and turned on gamer mode or whatever the f*** it was, it didn't crash. It was only after I went to the advanced mode tab that it crashed. Now whenever I'd launch it, it would crash after like a second or two. And then after the third crash is when the whole, like, incompatible operating system message or whatever it was popped up. My last hope is going to be reinstall Sonic Studio and then try and open the basic mode tab and disable Sonic Studio effects before it crashes three times. This had to be the answer. I'm genuinely not kidding. None of this was a bit. It wasn't something I set up for laughs or to try and make a point. This bullshit consumed my entire afternoon. Let this be a cautionary tale. Do not f with audio software. It will not give you any benefits. It will only give you headaches. Bye, have a great time. Okay, back to your regularly scheduled programming. So, given that in principle as well as in practice, as far as I can tell, none of those audio technologies are going to be able to provide proper 3D audio in Tarkov. Does that mean that we're basically left with stereo audio? We gotta watch this movie in black and white? Actually, no, it doesn't. Because Tarkov already has a pretty damn good solution in it right now. Which is where we finally circle back to binaural sound. Let's extend our image metaphor one final time. We can think about Tarkov's audio using binaural sound as a two-part system. First, the game has all of the stereo audio data, the black and white image, but it also has two massively important additional pieces of information, the locations in 3D space of both the source of the sound as well as the listener. With this additional data, the original image and spatial data is fed into Steam Audio, which then combines it all using something called an HRTF, which I explain in more detail in this video and don't feel like repeating, but ultimately it outputs natural and intuitive 3D audio in a stereo format. We can think about the HRTF in our metaphor as kind of like some sort of image colorization specialist who also happens to have been there when the original photo was taken and at the same time took their own color photo for reference. Now because this specialist knows everything about the camera, where the photo was taken, the lighting and the filters the resulting image should have, all of the other important contextual details, 
they're able to almost perfectly replicate the original image before they show it to you. This is effectively how binaural sound works in Tarkov. For now, all of the spatial information that Tarkov has is effectively trapped inside of the game, completely inaccessible to any audio processing software or hardware outside of it. This is why things like virtual surround in your headphones are never going to work reliably. By enabling binaural sound, you're telling Tarkov to use the spatial data that it already has to process the sound before sending it to your ears, resulting in your hearing the game audio specifically generated using that spatial data. Now, for those of you scoffing at your screens right now, thinking about how terrible the positional audio in Tarkov is, give me a few minutes and I think I'll be able to change your mind. First, in order to properly demonstrate this, you need to disable all of the things I just told you about. If you don't disable all of the external spatial audio shit before this demo, what you're basically doing is metaphorically running my nice quality photos through someone else's Instagram filter, which could very well make it look like total shit. So don't blame me if when you're hearing the audio in these demonstrations that it sounds wrong or confusing. If you think you've disabled everything and still aren't convinced at the end of these demos, I would triple check that nothing in Windows settings or headphone software or anything else is on that might be messing with your sound. Not only do countless folks adamantly argue that Tarkov has no vertical or 3D audio at all when Steam Audio is enabled, but some go so far as to say that the game engine is the reason why vertical audio is bad, and, and even that it's fundamentally impossible to be able to achieve vertical audio in Unity or even stereo audio at all. Now I guarantee these folks have never actually taken the time to look into any of this stuff. I'll let you be the judge of whether or not any examples I'm going to give you provide 3D audio. The first demonstration I want to give you is a project made by Matthew Kurzweil that's a little demo app showcasing Steam Audio's binaural sound, or HRTF, inside of Unity. He switches back and forth between normal Unity audio and Steam Audio, which he indicates on the screen. Pay attention to where the speaker is relative to you, the listener, represented by the head, and note by watching where it or its shadow moves if you're able to tell the difference between front versus back or above versus below while Steam Audio is on as compared to it off. I'm sure for lots of folks, that alone should have convinced you that 3D audio is not only possible with stereo headphones, but can actually be done quite well. Now I took this to the next level and wanted to try to implement Steam Audio myself inside of that little demo app I showed before when I was talking about occlusion. I took the time to read through the docs and prepared myself to go through what I figured would be a painful and likely annoying process of integrating Steam Audio into the project, given that I'm a total noob when it comes to Unity. I downloaded the Steam Audio framework, imported it into the project, selected the sphere that I had as my sound source before, checked the box indicating I wanted to spatialize that sound, added a new Steam Audio sound source component to it, and then checked the box for HRTF. This was the result. Ты засранец вонючий, мать твою, а? Ну иди сюда, попробуй меня трахнуть, я тебя сам трахну! Ублюдок, анонист чертов! Будь ты проклят! 
Иди, идиот, трахать тебя и всю семью! Говно собачье жлоб вонючий! Дерьмо, сука, падла, иди сюда, мерзавец! Негодяй, гад, иди сюда, ты говно! Жопа! So yeah, that took me about 30 minutes in total to do, and I'm hoping that that simple demo has convinced you that Steam Audio's binaural sound has no problem working pretty damn well within Unity. All right, on to the final test, the thing that everyone's sitting there wondering about. What about Tarkov? Well, allow me to show you the results of some testing I did with a few different content creators, as well as with the community, to try to get an answer to that question that wasn't entirely based on folks' opinions and anecdotes. When it comes to localizing sound in Tarkov, we all know that a large part comes from experience, map knowledge, and context clues. While these aspects of localization undoubtedly play a huge role, they're also largely impossible to measure, quantify, or control for. I wanted to remove these variables entirely from the equation in order to try and determine just how much spatial and contextual information can be inferred from sound alone. We can't forget all the situations where all we really have is sound, even if you're the one playing the game. Maybe you're on a new map, or in a new area you've never been to, or you're a new player altogether. Maybe the sound you heard was too quick for you to be able to turn your head for more spatial cues. Who knows? Now what I'm about to show you was actually the second iteration of testing. The first iteration was quite limited, and was mostly done to try and understand the sorts of biases or issues that these tests could potentially introduce if I didn't design them properly. I learned a ton from those tests, and was able to use that to improve the second iteration. I want to give a massive thanks to everybody that took part in the first round of testing. Your contributions to science will not be in vain. Now, of course, I learned a ton even from the second iteration and already know of many ways I could expand and improve the tests further. They're definitely not perfect, but at the moment, it's the best we've got. Let me share with you the tests I did with some streamer buddies of mine, as well as tests I opened up to the community, providing them a link to a Google Doc that would act both as a survey and a quiz. Now, there were three types of tests. The first being tests that measure your ability to determine fine direction, to be able to tell if something was 45 degrees to your front left or your back right. The second tests compared audio from directly in front and behind, and the third set of tests compared audio at different vertical heights. Now I designed this third batch of tests in intentionally challenging and ambiguous situations, both above and below quite close to you as well as further away. I knew for sure that these were going to be a challenge. Now, of course, I'm not going to be able to show the full tests for each person, so instead I edited together a summary of all the answers. I'm going to show you a quick preview of what they heard for each of the test cases, with visual context and the relevant diagram, as well as the correct answer on screen. I split up all the test cases into two groups. First, let's take a look at how they did with binaural sound on. H. 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 That's F. F. I think this is F. I think E. I think E. I think that's behind me. B. This is B. C. B. E is behind me. A is front, B is back. A's more in front. The yeah, A's in front. A. Downstairs. I'm going with D. I want to say that's me with reload A again. Behind me. Um, E. A. A again. I feel like this is me, like me reloading every time. In front of me. That one's in front. E. Uh, behind me again. E. Sorry, just a quick one, Veritas. It's a bit confusing with this. B. I don't know. This is by Nero Audio. I know it is. This that right. I I don't know. I don't know on that one. All right. So now we have a bit of a baseline. Binaural seemed to do quite well in many cases, although it definitely wasn't as consistent in the later tests that involved the verticality. It's worth mentioning that both that friendly guy and Pestily do use binaural sound normally when they play, and some man doesn't use it and has said many times that he hates it. Fix your ears, boy. 
Perhaps given that he's more used to binaural sound being off, he'll do better. Let's take a look. Actually, no, it's D. It's D. It's D. C. Still B. That's G. I would say G, but it's like, it's on me. I, I am the sound. That's a G. I want to say F or H. F. I. I don't think either one of them are behind me, honestly. Those are the exact same sound. None of those are behind me. They're either both behind or both in front. They sound the same. None of those are in front of me. Both of those are me. He's in front. Hey, that's me reloading. A. A. I feel like that's C in front. That's behind me. In front of me? C? That sounds like I'm reloading. A. A. That's on me. C? That's in front of me. C. That's C front then. C front. A? When do I get the answers? Well, that was interesting. I'll let those results speak for themselves. Now, of course, a test like this is going to be extremely difficult for anybody taking it. We've evolved to utilize all of our senses together in tandem. That's what we're best at. Nevertheless, I was quite impressed that they were able to get as many as they did correct in both test groups, given the lack of visual information and gameplay context. Now, clearly binaural sound isn't the one-size-fits-all miracle solution to audio in and of itself, but can we really deny the results? Now, how about the community data? What can we learn from that? Surprisingly enough, our sample size of three content creators seem to have been a decently accurate representation of the community as a whole. Going through over 100 responses that I got from community members, we can see that the community got about 56% of the test cases correct when binaural sound was on, along with 18% correct with binaural off. Of course, I'd love to have a larger sample size than a bit more than 100 people, but I still found it interesting that segmenting all of the respondents by the audio settings they use and averaging their test scores Stereo headphones came out on top with an average of 40% correct, more than each of the others. I can't say at this point if this is statistically significant or if there's a true connection there. Nevertheless, if that data contradicted my hypothesis, I'd see that as quite relevant to the discussion. Now, one last thing we need to consider here as well is that these questions were all multiple choice questions, which means we can actually calculate what the average score would be based purely on random chance. Now, we had six questions with eight possible options, four questions with three possible options, and eight questions with five possible options. That means if you didn't even take the quiz and simply guessed randomly for each question, you would, on average, get about 20% correct. Now, for shits and giggles, I actually went to one of those dice rolling websites and based my results for each answer on the roll of the dice, and I managed to get four right, or 22%, based purely on chance. So all of that means that, for all intents and purposes, without any context clues or map knowledge, normal Tarkov audio gives you almost no information about its location. Turning on binaural sound will very likely increase your ability to localize sound without any other context clues twofold, and I'd be willing to bet, although this is purely speculative on my part, that binaural sound coupled with map knowledge and situational context will drastically increase your ability to localize sounds compared to non-binaural sound. Maybe one day I'll be able to design a way to put that theory to the test, but until then, the best I can do is theory craft based on my experiences. Sometimes I win fights based on the correct audio information I get from binaural sound, and sometimes I lose them. Sometimes I interpret the audio information that I get from the game correctly, and sometimes I incorrectly interpret accurate audio information. <sighs> uh. 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 
In most of these cases, assuming that there's no nonsense caused by any other Tarkov bugs that have nothing to do with binaural sound, the spatial audio in Tarkov with binaural sound is extremely accurate and gives me all the information I need. All I can do is blame myself for losing these fights, not Tarkov's audio. Dines was another one of my buddies that helped me with my preliminary localization testing, as well as having sent me multiple clips of different issues that he'd been experiencing that we already mentioned he attributed almost entirely to Steam Audio's introduction into Tarkov. And we did say multiple times that the issue started specifically back in 12.3, although Steam Audio wasn't added to the game until 12.6, but I'll give him the benefit of the doubt that maybe he misremembered the patch, that's no big deal. Now what I do find interesting and potentially relevant here was that around that time period, 12.3 was February 2020. And when I was looking through some older clips to see if I could find anything relevant, I came across this clip from one month before, January of 2020. He said he'd played with binaural sound on for a few months when it first came out, didn't like it, and then turned it off. And while I'm not saying that this necessarily had anything to do with any of the issues he claimed he experienced at the time, what he experienced sounds to me to be entirely consistent with running binaural sound on while at the same time running 7.1 virtual surround. So who knows? Now he'd since gotten rid of those headphones and was now adamant that he was using normal stereo ones, so along with checking that he wasn't using any sort of surround software, I had him take the little test. Now the test results clearly demonstrated that he could localize quite well with binaural on, in fact far better than with it off, but he was still skeptical, saying that he felt as if his experience in raids told him something different. In front. Right in front of me. Below. That's below. He's running away from me. One more time. I can't tell direction. He's running backwards. I'll look in the front, he's running behind. Now the issue here is that everything that happened before, everything that he experienced in the past, would have been without all of the knowledge of the issues we've discussed here. Things that I could tell from the examples he gave me were primarily issues with different levels, stairs, or netcode. Every one of those bugs involves giving you unreliable, ambiguous, and confusing information. They all make it harder to localize sound. So of course, if he believes those issues are caused by Steam Audio, he'd conclude that he has issues localizing sounds with it on. I couple that with the fact that earlier he even admitted that he could never tell the difference between it on versus off. I don't realize the difference. No, if you ask me though, I don't realize the difference if there's any difference in Steam Audio or, or normal audio. I feel like they're basically the same. And it's no surprise that he doesn't want to use it. He really didn't think it would help him in any way, and only thought that it would hurt him in a ton of different ways. I wanted to give it one more try to see if I could change his mind, so I asked him to humor me, turn on Steam Audio, and give it a try for at least one raid. The following encounter happened not long after he got into this raid. Now as you watch this, pay close attention to how he acts during this engagement. Pay attention to where he looks, moves, aims. Take note of how much information he's acting on visually, and how much of it is auditory. And you tell me if it looks like he's having any trouble localizing enemies with sound while binaural audio is on. I don't have friends to play. Can we play together, please? Listen, man. I, I'm gonna forgive you, okay? I'm gonna forgive you, okay? Please. Let me friends. Hello? You bitch! AI is running on it. Hey man, don't destroy my window, okay? What the hell? Can you guys please leave the windows alone? We're gonna die.
Let's briefly look at a few moments from that fight and examine them with the additional perspective that we gained from the localization test results that we just went over. Imagine a scenario just like this, except maybe we're outdoors fighting somebody in front of us and maybe we're in cover behind a tree. Now imagine we get shot at like this. Without the helpful visual context that we get from the bullet hitting the wall, let's say the bullet went whizzing by our head and didn't hit anything in front of us, there's no doubt in my mind that many folks might assume that the gunshot was from in front of us, given how ambiguous the front and rear sounds are with binaural off. It makes sense that our default assumption would be that the gunshot's coming from the person in front of us, the one that we know is already there. In that case, there'd be no reason for you to turn your head, pretty much the only other thing that would give you the context that the person is behind you. So chances are you'd just get shot on the back of the head and you'd never know what happened. With binaural sound on, you'd be much more likely to instantly realize that you were getting shot at from behind and relocate. Imagine you had binaural sound on and you were in that scenario and it saved your life. I could pretty much guarantee you that nobody would say, wow, thank God I had binaural sound on, otherwise I wouldn't have been able to tell that that shot came from behind me. It would very likely never cross your mind. You'd probably be more caught up in the idea that, thank God that guy whiffed a shot on me while I was basically standing still. There's a number of different bits of audio context clues there that would have been far less obvious or accurate had he not had binaural sound on. First, there's this really subtle footstep we hear, which we can easily tell is the enemy towards the H direction on this reference image. Then there's these footsteps on wood that we can easily tell are coming from the E location, directly behind us. And finally, after we relocate to behind the door, we hear this reload sound that is clearly coming from the B location. Now, based on the clear and consistent results of the test that we did, if he had had binaural sound off, we know that the sound that came from H would be pretty much indistinguishable from basically anywhere on our left side from almost directly in front of us to nearly directly behind. The footsteps behind us could have been misinterpreted as someone running from the far doors in front of us, maybe coming up past the elevators in the lobby. And then the reload sound that we hear might sound like it was directly to our right which could mean that the original enemy relocated and was on the right side of the entranceway in the lobby, or it was a reload from the guy that we thought we heard earlier near the elevators at the lobby holding the right side of the door. With binaural sound on, every aspect of the audio of that situation was clear and unambiguous. Of course, we have no way of knowing, but with binaural sound off, that situation could very well have gone completely different. Moving on from structured tests, I wanted to share one more example that's a pretty fun anecdote because we get to see two sides of the same fight with two different audio experiences. Break and Skulls, a longtime friend of mine and incredibly skilled OG Tarkov player that's been playing basically forever, had the following encounter on Reserve not too long ago. Oh, the lag. Nah, these, they're baiting. Now listening back to the moments leading up to the engagement, the enemy's footsteps sounded quite ambiguous. Maybe they're upstairs, maybe they're down below. I personally find it really hard to tell, and obviously so did he. So ambiguous even that the engagement felt suspect to him. Now the interesting part about this engagement was that the other person in the fight was me, and I had an entirely different audio experience. You're actually done aiming down sights. Now clearly I could very easily tell where he was from the audio cues, and my being ready for the fight because of better audio while he wasn't ready due to the ambiguity of his audio cues is largely why I won the fight. Now, Skulls is a way better player than me, and yet my ability to more confidently localize him because of the audio was the most significant part of that fight. After seeing the engagement from his perspective, I dropped by his stream to ask him about his audio settings, and this was his response. No, I don't. That shit, I don't like, I don't like, uh, final, uh, audio. Bert. <laughs> hey, audio was scuffed. Bro, my, my shit's been scuffed all day. It's pissing me off. Like, I don't die often at all. Today, something's fucked up, man. I don't know what's going on. I have it off.
I, nah, bro. That shit gets weird sometimes, man. It pisses me off. So here we have at least one case where it seems as if binaural sound provided a direct advantage in a fight compared to having it off. The opposite of which is pretty much unanimously what we hear from other content creators. Now it's obviously not proof of anything in particular, but it's an interesting data point. And what's even better was a few days later after our fight and discussion about audio, where he seemed to feel quite strongly about how he didn't like Steam Audio, he came by my stream and said this. I turn on binaural audio, by the way, it's better. One of us. Well, I guess I'll take the W and call that progress. This brings us all the way back to our little audio visual. When you have binaural sound toggled off, Steam Audio is bypassed entirely, with all of the audio in the chain flowing up from Unity, passing through BSG's custom processing layer, which handles occlusion for pretty much all of the non-ambient sounds, and then gets sent to your headphones. If you have binaural sound on, when you launch your game, the Steam Audio library is loaded and is added into the audio signal chain. As previously mentioned, Steam Audio is a fully featured audio framework with a number of discrete modules that all have their own responsibilities although each of these modules is standalone and optional. There's a module that handles binaural sound, one that handles occlusion, modules that handle transmission, reflection, attenuation, and more. Since 2020, when the initial integration of Steam Audio was added to Tarkov, the only module that has ever been enabled is the one responsible for binaural processing. All of the remaining modules are deactivated. With Steam Audio on, the flow of data remains the same underneath it, Unity generates the audio based on what's going on in the game, and it gets passed up into BSG's legacy occlusion system, which determines if the sound is going to be occluded based on the location of the source, location of the listener, and the occlusion boundaries they created. And then the audio gets passed up once more into Steam Audio, along with the relevant location data, so it can apply the HRTF processing to the sound, which ultimately makes it out to your ears. So when we visualize the architecture of Tarkov's audio like this, as well as understand what each element of this architecture is responsible for, I'm hoping that it makes it a bit easier for you to understand my frustrations when it comes to the audio issues that people face and where they end up placing the blame. When you don't hear nearby footsteps of an enemy running up to you from a stairwell, it's probably because BSG's occlusion system occluded the sound partially or entirely. Something that's entirely separate and independent from Steam Audio. Oh, fuck off, dude! I fucking hate staircases, dude. This should make sense conceptually when you're looking at the diagrams that I've showed you before, and also in practice is exactly what we see in the game. Just like the comparisons I showed earlier, where the occlusion behavior was entirely the same, independent of whether Steam Audio was on or not. Now when you don't hear your teammate run up to you until the very last minute, and then he scares the shit out of you, it's most likely because of your connection or server-related issues that cause desync. Unless, of course, it's just another one of those cases where occlusion is involved. Schlaufe. If from your game client's perspective your teammate isn't running right behind you, there's no reason for your client to play the sound at all. That is of course until the client and server updates and gets much closer to being fully synchronized, at which point your teammate's going to teleport forward to being right behind you and it'll suddenly play the sound. Oh my. Now, in very much the same way as the last two examples, when you enable binaural sound and suddenly report that everything sounds backwards to you, that you're totally unable to locate them at all, it all sounds confusing and ambiguous. Considering all of the data proves that pretty much conclusively this isn't the case for the vast majority of people, it's far more likely that either you're running some piece of software that's applying its own processing to the audio, processing that has no spatial or contextual information about the game, Processing that effectively has no way to improve your ability to localize sounds and can really only hurt it. Or, in a significantly smaller set of circumstances, you might be one of those unlucky folks whose head and ears don't jive well with the HRTF that the game uses. Now I fully understand and can empathize with many of you that have audio issues, and recognize that it's going to be pretty tempting to jump on that last option as the explanation. Everybody wants to assume that the problem is entirely outside of their control. It's not that they don't like change, it's not that they haven't given it a chance or spent any time trying to get used to something new, something better. It's not that they paid $400 for some RGB gamer surround headphones and want to justify the purchase, or that they saw a YouTube video from their favorite content creator telling them to download and use some piece of software to improve their audio. Software that they likely don't fully understand and may very well have misconfigured or enabled some other setting that sounded cool and helpful. 
But nah, I'm sure everybody just has one of those really uniquely shaped ears that happens to be incompatible with the game's HRTF. While I obviously don't have any numbers on how many folks actually have this issue, I have a feeling that while, say, like 3% of the population might fit into this category, something like 53% of the folks that have issues are going to come to this conclusion. Of course, those numbers are bullshit, but all I'm saying here is that please just dot your I's and cross your T's before you come to the conclusion that there's nothing you can do to fix the issue, that it's entirely outside of your control. Pay attention to the examples that I give and have given throughout this video of folks who have remedied some of their issues and see if maybe some of those apply to you. So, speaking of blame, with all of this positive press for Steam Audio for me, is there really like no way that any of the criticisms or issues that people blame on it are true? Like, there's got to be some downside, right? Well, that's a fair question. Let's discuss a few things. And last but not least, sound settings. Now, I know this doesn't seem like a big deal, but having your sound on binaural sound or Steam sound will actually cost you a tiny bit of frames. And also, I believe binaural audio, although it sounds a little bit crisper, it is actually a little bit buggy at the moment, so I would definitely turn this off up until they fix it. So I've personally got a pretty beefy gaming rig. If there's a performance hit with binaural sound on, I've never really noticed it. Although, of course, this isn't exactly enough to fairly determine what sort of performance differences we're talking about when it comes to the larger spectrum of hardware that the community has. Now, unfortunately, I can't buy a dozen different machines and run these tests myself. This isn't Linus goddamn tech tips. I had to crowdsource the data. I asked a bunch of community members to run a bunch of raids, half with binaural sound on and half with it off, running the same map each time and taking note of where and when they take their measurements, recording their average frame rates, etc. Thank you so much to everybody that volunteered their time with this. Now these tests were simple, and of course not flawless by any means, and the sample size isn't huge, but for now it's all we're able to do on short notice and with limited time and resources. So in this test we had a decent spread of hardware and settings. Ryzen and Intel CPUs, 1080s to 3080s, medium settings at 1080 resolution, and maxed out settings at 1440. And the tests also include a pretty good smattering of maps, from factory, customs, woods, interchange, and reserve. Now looking at the raw data, we see ranges in average FPS values between binaural on and off from about a 5% improvement to a 12% hit. Now while I doubt that anybody would argue that binaural processing is going to improve performance, I think a few of these data points demonstrate that there's just so many factors that affect your in-game frame rate, with binaural sound only being a small part. So at any given time, all sorts of other factors that would affect performance, like scav spawns, might not be as significant as another raid, ultimately giving you more FPS overall while binaural is on compared to a raid with a particularly high number of scavs with binaural off. I'm sure with a larger sample size of testers, raids, and maps, this data would smooth out much more, but something tells me that we're unlikely to see huge performance differences one way or the other. If you're one of those folks playing on a much lower end machine and you struggle to get 30 or 40 FPS and need every frame you can get to make the game playable, well then this might be relevant for you. But honestly, I still think it would be worth toggling it on and giving it a try for a raid or two, either way, if your main concern is performance. Alright, it's time to talk about the elephant in the room. The phenomenon commonly referred to in the community as ghost sounds or phantom audio. Now first things first, this issue is, as far as I can tell, the only issue that I can confidently say is directly linked with enabling binaural sound. Now I have heard a bunch of reports of people hearing ghost sounds when they had binaural sound disabled, but it's only fair to apply the same sort of skepticism to these claims as I have been to those critical of binaural sound. Without hard evidence that this is happening with it disabled, I'm going to chalk it up to those folks misremembering or misinterpreting and maintain the tentative conclusion that this is specifically an issue that you will only experience with binaural sound on, at least right now. Now second, the community seems to want to treat this as if it's a dozen different bugs, although it seems pretty evident that it's in fact a single bug that we're experiencing at different times with different sounds. Now the next thing worth noting is that, as far as I can tell, these aren't the same ghost sounds as we experienced in the past. 
And this is, I think, a pretty important distinction. Back in the day when Steam Audio was turned back on after the five-month hiatus, those ghost sounds that we were hearing were seemingly random audio blips, like enemy footsteps, very precisely located where they could not have been, like a literal ghost. You'd be standing out in an open field and hear a footstep literally right next to you two feet away. This phenomenon was, for all intents and purposes, entirely unpredictable and random audio from maybe somewhere on the map, although I'm not really sure, but it definitely wasn't where you were hearing it. What we've been experiencing now for a bit feels like an entirely different flavor of a partially related issue. What you're hearing appears to be real, actual sounds from your raid in precisely the direction that you're hearing it. But usually the beginning fraction of a second of audio is played way louder than it should be, with the remaining audio properly adjusted for attenuation over distance. Here are a few examples. Like, not a proper fucking... Hear that glass? Yep. He's at the offices. He's dead. He is. He's dead. Nice. You're cracked. Shout out to Tarkov for the broken audio. So, why does this matter and what does it mean for you? Well, first, this issue seems to affect different people differently, and different maps seem to experience it more than others. Now that being said, I've gone multiple days without ever noticing this issue, and even at worst, it might be four or five sound blips in a 40-minute raid when other folks claim they experience it in every single raid constantly. Now, I don't think any of us really knows what's responsible for these big differences, both for one person over different days versus different people on the same day. All we know is that everybody's going to have a unique experience, so you shouldn't assume what yours is going to be based on someone else's claims. Next, the loudness and suddenness of some of these sound blips can definitely be startling for some people in many cases. I understand how it might be quite annoying for some people, although I'll be honest that I absolutely have no problem identifying pretty much instantly what's a proper nearby sound and what's one of those glitched distant sounds. The speed at which the volume shifts from too loud to properly attenuated is faster than I'm usually processing the sounds anyway most of the time. So as long as I'm not jump scared by a super loud sudden one, which isn't really a problem because I don't play with my volume cranked really loud, I'm so used to them that honestly I don't really have much of a problem ignoring them. And lastly, as much as I have to say it, this bug can actually be advantageous in many ways. The sounds you hear are real sounds from some distance further than you should hear, so you're kind of gaining information that you shouldn't have. Now in many ways, information is the most important resource in Tarkov. So while this bug might be annoying, it's not without its benefits. Check out this clip from Shudaville, where he was getting ready to do some sniping on customs. Happened to have heard one of those glitched key sounds. Which made him think to check the closest available locked door. The upstairs office area inside of Big Red. After busting out the window to get a clearer look, it just so happens that he was right. Eddie ends up killing a guy that was running to loot the safe. This bug has come in handy numerous times when I was doing quests that required me to get scav kills. When I'd hear one of these glitch voice lines, I would just run in that direction for a few seconds and lo and behold, there they'd be. Right where I heard them. So ultimately, at the end of the day, this bug for me ends up a wash. It doesn't really bother me or change how I play 99% of the time. I don't think I've ever been killed or had any real in-game costs associated with this bug. At worst, it's annoying occasionally. I understand that different people experience it more or less than others. If you really feel that it affects your gameplay or it breaks your immersion, and that that outweighs the benefits of having better positional audio, who am I to tell you you're wrong? At that point, it's your subjective opinion and you're entitled to it. Now, hands down, the most annoying part of this bug is that if it didn't exist, 
I'd be able to confidently say that everybody was completely wrong about all of the bugs with binaural, which would make my life a whole lot easier and would make for a much more convincing video. But you can't win them all. Now Nikita's told me already that they've identified the problem, that it's an issue internal to Steam Audio, and that they're waiting on a fix from them. Now I was initially skeptical of this, but after doing a bit of digging, I found a few other instances where similar sounding bugs existed in other games using Steam Audio as well. Although who knows if they're exactly the same, if they're related or not. Either way, given that Nikita has acknowledged audio as being one of the most serious issues the community has been complaining about, I'm hopeful that he'll do what he can to get this issue sorted sooner rather than later. Before we move on, there's one last thing I want to point out here because it's actually far more annoying than any ghost sound people complain about. And that's people complaining about the new popping sound when you throw grenades. Saying that it's a ghost sound or a bug or something that's tied to Steam Audio. This is an intended feature in the game and is in most cases realistic. I double checked with Nikita just to be sure and he confirmed that what we're hearing is the ignition of the fuse when it's struck by the primer after it leaves your hand. This tends to be more common for Russian grenades, although all sorts of grenades from all over the world have similar sounds. Here's a few examples. You may look. So we had to run back. <laughs> oh. <laughs> 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 Maybe in the future they'll add more unique sounds for different grenades. Maybe adjust the volume levels. Who knows? But for now I think it's an interesting addition to the game that people need to stop confusing as a bug caused by Steam Audio. Okay, so what other issues are there with Steam Audio? Well, to be honest, I think that's it as far as I've been able to tell. It may have an impact on your game's performance for some folks, but I reckon it's unlikely to be significant for most of the community. You might be one of those very rare cases where Steam Audio's HRTF settings just doesn't jive very well with the shape of your ears or your head. Maybe it'll take a little bit to get used to if you haven't spent any time with it, and you might hear some distant blips of audio that are louder than they should be. Gunshots, voice lines, grenade pins, unlocking doors. They might startle you every now and then, they might totally annoy you, they might happen to you all the time in every raid, or they might be the occasional distraction, but not really a big deal. It's not up to me to weigh all of those considerations for you, you have to do some testing for yourself and make that value consideration on your own. See how performance is affected, if at all, and see how it feels. And if the improved ability to localize sounds like it's worth it to you, great. If not, fine by me. I'm hurt. So, you might be thinking to yourself, if all of this is true, if that's pretty much the whole story, then I still don't understand why Steam Audio gets so much hate. Why do all my favorite streamers tell me to turn it off? There's got to be more to this, right? Well, the answer to that, like most things, is complicated. And in order to be fair, it really needs to be addressed on a case-by-case -case basis. While each of these examples are directly related to some of the confusion or misconceptions that we've already talked about, they all provide an additional bit of context and a slightly different perspective that I think is worth discussing. Let's take a look at a few examples from some of my discussions with some other content creators in the community. And before I get into these examples, it goes without saying, although I'm going to say it anyway, that any criticisms, including the ones I might have already mentioned, are not meant to be malicious. I'm not trying to throw shade. I'm not trying to talk shit or start drama. I've got nothing but love and respect for all these guys, and I want to thank them for being generous with their time and their feedback. The purpose of these examples are to provide clear and concrete examples of some larger ideas that I think the community would benefit from hearing. Now, I'm saying all of this for the sake of the community so that you can understand that I'm coming from a place of open and honest dialogue, and even if we may not agree on everything, it's all love. I already know that all of my content creator friends understand that this is the case. So let's start with this handsome bastard. I was hanging out in Glorious' stream and asked him what his opinion on Steam Audio was, if he used it, and why or why not. 
He pulled up his current audio settings and said this. I'm not using binaural audio. And the reason why I not, I'm not using binaural audio is because it's been letting me down so many times. It's like, I don't know why, for some reason, it cancels some sounds. It happened to me before. Like, if someone is coming from my side, they basically can come all the way close to me and they just kill me. And then I see them in that, you know, that scene, like when I'm about to die, falling down, I see them to my right. And I'm like, wait, what? What just happened? So that's why I stopped using it. Now, of course, we now know some of the things that might be involved here. So in order to eliminate the most common culprit, I asked him to clarify if any of those missing sounds he was talking about ever involved stairs. He said he had a great example of the missing sounds and graciously took the time from a stream to provide some more context, pulling up this clip. Ooh, wait, that's a player. Yeah, 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 that's a player, baby. Where's the audio? GG's. There's no audio, dude. GG's. Well done. Well played. Now, I hope at this point it goes without saying that we're dealing with the classic issue of audio being occluded because of the different levels of an indoor building. We pretty much already determined quite confidently the cause of this problem. But interestingly enough, that's not even the most interesting part. I noticed that the clip he showed was not more than an hour prior to me coming into the stream. It literally happened on the same day. Now, I later confirmed that each of the elements of my understanding of the situation were accurate, so I wasn't misinterpreting or misrepresenting. Uh, right when he came out. And I haven't been using it since then. I tried it one day when it came out. It let me down, and I didn't use it ever since. So, to briefly summarize, when asked to explain why he didn't use Steam Audio, he said it was because of missing sounds, like silent footsteps and then showed a clip from the same day that both confirmed it was the all too common stairs issue that has nothing to do with Steam Audio, and this example happened while he had Steam Audio off. Now, of course, this line of reasoning would likely have required a little bit of subconscious mental gymnastics to avoid the inevitable cognitive dissonance, but this sort of thing is actually not very uncommon. It happens to all sorts of people all the time. He experienced a problem in the game and likely fell victim to the correlation versus causation mistake, and then anytime he experienced the same problem in the future, it likely didn't occur to him that those experiences hinted that he might have been wrong about his initial conclusion. In fact, even with binaural sound off, his brain seemed to associate the problem with audio that he experienced with binaural sound. This is a kind of variation of a well-known psychological phenomenon called confirmation bias, where we ignore evidence that's at odds with our current belief system, paying attention only to evidence that supports it. Confirmation bias creeps into all sorts of aspects of our life, and it's actually a broader concept covering a number of different related phenomena that you might recognize, like anytime you read your grandmother's political rants on Facebook. First, there's attitude polarization, which is when disagreements tend to become more exaggerated when two people with opposing views are shown the same evidence. There's belief perseverance, which is when people stick to their guns or maybe even dig their heels in further when they're presented with evidence that contradicts their beliefs. There's the irrational primacy effect, where people place more significance on evidence that came earlier in their experience, often honing in on whatever observations, assumptions, or conclusions they came to when they were first introduced to the topic. And lastly, there's the illusory correlation, which I briefly mentioned earlier, identifying a correlation between events or situations that's not actually there. Now keep these concepts in mind as I continue with the discussion here. Let me briefly bring up something that is a subtle problem that's related to language and how we communicate about these sorts of issues. All too often, lots of folks use the same words or phrases as someone else in a conversation, and neither of them realize that they're using the same terminology to refer to conceptually different things. I see this time and time again, and it leads to tons of confusion and disagreement, although it's never done maliciously or intentionally. If you want to add this, it's on. I don't use headsets at all and I have very good hearing in the game. I can tell where people are, what they're doing, and that's because I play a lot. Might be someone who doesn't play a lot, might be different. V vertical audio is still bugged. Vertical audio is still bugged. Now, while I knew what he meant and agree with everything he said, I want to point out the usage of one particular phrase, something that almost every single person uses who talks about this topic, but all too often it's something that people use interchangeably to describe different things. And that phrase is vertical audio. 
When he said vertical audio was bugged, I pretty much instantly suspected that this was one of those cases where a particular phrasing might cause some confusion. So I asked for some clarification to be sure. Um, you, you mean different floors, right? I wouldn't even mean, I wouldn't even say different floors, Eritas. I would say just stairs. I would just say, I would say just stairs for me. Like, like if people are above me running around or below me running around, I can, I know where they are. It's just on stairs. I would say just stairs. So now imagine that I hadn't asked for clarification. Think about how many people might have been confused by what he meant or interpreted it in all sorts of other ways. Now, after saying vertical audio was bugged, in his clarification, he literally says with binaural sound, he can locate people above and below him, which is basically the definition of vertical. This happens to be one of those cases where a content creator actually likes Steam audio and fully recognizes the benefits you get from binaural sound, and yet it's entirely possible that a noteworthy percentage of folks that might have been paying attention could walk away from the conversation thinking that there was still no way that you could get any sort of vertical audio context from Tarkov. So this is kind of similar to what I just discussed regarding ghost sounds. Some people mean one thing and lots of folks understand it as another. Now this is why I try to be really clear when I have these discussions and it's why I'm glad I asked for clarification from that friendly guy because I could tell based on the specifics of the conversation that he meant something different than many people would take from it. Be aware of this anytime you hear people use the phrase vertical audio or ghost sounds and stuff like that from now on. Be mindful of what exactly people could possibly mean when they use a particular word or phrase. If there's any ambiguity, don't be afraid to ask for clarification. Now, we all get things wrong. We misinterpret things in the heat of the moment. We don't see things or hear things that are there, or we hear and see things that aren't. We misremember, often coming up with whatever narrative makes sense to us. Now, let me briefly revisit a clip I showed earlier as a basic example of this sort of thing. What the fuck? What? He's not even making... <coughs> what? He ran up to me without making any running sounds whatsoever. Didn't even fucking hear him. I saw him. Now watching it back again, we can see clearly that he did hear the guy approaching. In the heat of the moment, he simply misremembered what just happened. Again, these sorts of things happen to every single one of us all the time, whether we realize it or not. He got killed by the glitchy player scav due to who knows what, but what's noteworthy is that the thing that most people will focus on when something like this happens is that they didn't hear any sound. Now in this case, it wasn't necessarily what Voxy was focused on. I'm mostly just using this as an accessible example for when these sorts of things tend to occur. Now of course it makes sense that you might conclude that this was an audio bug. Hearing blasts from the gun is one of the most obvious parts of being shot. But what's more subtle is the lack of firing animations, muzzle flash, recoil, chambering rounds after every shot. The entire process of firing the gun is not shown from his client's perspective. Yet this is the exact thing that folks would immediately conclude was an audio bug. Especially if they happen to misremember the beginning of the engagement, assuming that as that scav approached, he ran up making no noise. The reality is, it was probably one of those pesky synchronization issues like I talked about earlier from Eroctic's video, or something else entirely that I haven't even thought of. Sometimes we say these things out loud and other people reinforce it. It hardens in our minds, we then feel like we're justified, need to defend it, and sometimes we even take it personally when people are skeptical. Now I get this vibe all the time from folks that come in while I'm streaming and want to show me examples of cheaters, exploits, or audio bugs that almost always has a much simpler explanation. Often they think I'm attacking them or they take it personally that I'm skeptical of their conclusion. We misremember the details of all sorts of situations all the time, with our conclusions inevitably affecting our recollections or opinions in one way or another. It's simply a fact that we all need to accept that we get shit wrong all the time. None of us are special in this regard. I've recorded loads of examples when I was quite confident that someone was cheating, that I think I hit all of my shots and I got fucked over by the game, stuff like that. More often than I'd like to admit, after watching the clip back, I realized that all of my shots missed, I realized I ran out of ammo, or the gun jammed, and I wasn't paying attention. Now, sometimes I'm lucky enough to get to see the other person's perspective in the same fight, and see how I got netcoded, how they got a lucky helmet ricochet, or how they simply outplayed me with information that I thought that they shouldn't have, and I was simply wrong. Now naturally, given that hard drive space is so important, and these sorts of things don't make for great highlight videos, these clips usually end up in my recycle bin. 
Now between writing this part of the script and editing this video, I did have one such occurrence that I wanted to highlight because it included so many things related to this video, from audio bugs to suspected cheaters to admitting I was wrong and even one of the many hilarious ways in which I like to gather data for videos like this. I say that mostly kidding. See, like right there, that's one of the... Someone threw like a fucking flashbang or something. Oh, you know what? That's what it was, a smoke. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> it's a smoke grenade. But that means someone is literally throwing smoke grenades over there. Yo, are you my friend from earlier that needed an ophthalmoscope? No. Oh, okay. Is that guy down the hall shooting with a... Is he cheating? Uh, no, I think he's... Do you have binaural sound on? Uh, I don't think so. I don't know, I just got... I, I'm not gonna lie, I got a new PC like two days ago. Open up your menu and pull up audio options. And tell me if binaural sound is... This guy's legit, huh? Wow, you're a cheating son of a bitch, huh, bud? Just fucking die already! Tell me honestly, are you are you God legit? Are you legit, bud? Yeah, I'm legit. Yeah, you're legit. All right, well. Are you streaming right now, bud? Now, at the beginning of that engagement, I wasn't paying attention to some key details. I misconstrued some normal tactics like jiggle peeking and pre-firing as indications that the dude had ESP or something, and then that tainted my whole outlook on the entire fight. In hindsight, I just looked like a douchebag and honestly could stand to learn a little bit from the homie Glorious in a case like this. GG's. Well done. Well played. Of course, I didn't realize that until I watched the clip back and tried to be as honest and objective as I could. Everything after the first shot, like at this point, watch my face. I was like, whoa, that first fucking peak. That's when I instantly got sus. Everything after that was audio keys. So this right here is where he would have had to cross. Yeah, okay. I think he did. And you hear footsteps right here, and then I'm blocking the fucking doorway with my scope. And then he comes... I think he probably just, like, swept across the door. Are you legit, <laughs> bud? I think he was legit. We are so wrong so often that people need to fucking, like, man up and recognize that the shit you think you remember then that you swear i swear to god this is what happened and there's no way you're just gonna be wrong so many more times than you realize so folks need to just be more open to being to admitting that they were wrong now on one of the most recent episodes of the podcast that features deadly slob a banger of an episode by the way would highly recommend jesse articulated this idea perfectly 
I've kind of made it my shtick, right? The replay buffer thing. Like when I die, I almost always clip it, watch it back almost immediately. Because a lot of times I'll play with a duo and I'm like, all right, I have time. So we'll watch the clip back. I can't tell you how many countless, countless times upon watching the clip back, I went, oh yeah, I heard his audio. I was mm. tunnel visioned and I was, I thought he was going to be here. And I was thinking in my head, this is going to be a sick play. And then I'm dead. And I go, what? I didn't hear any audio. And then I eat my words 13 seconds later. Yeah, and I'm people really don't do that. that. People don't, people don't give themselves that opportunity. And a lot of times, like a lot of that stuff, it was a cheater or it was a two man. It was this, it was that. A lot of the things we think, watch your clip back within 10 seconds of you dying and so much of what you think happens so often your brain just made that junk up it's like what there there must have been three of them and i watched the clip back and i'm like no i just see him right there he ran and i just missed it because i thought he was gonna be over here the final example i want to give here comes from one of my recent streams when a viewer asked my opinion about a video done by rengar related to the considerations regarding armor class and the zones they protect and how it all relates to recent changes to how damage on blacked out limbs work I was admittedly unfamiliar with the video, wanted to hear what he had to say, but I have to admit I generally haven't been impressed with a lot of the methodologies and conclusions many Tarkov science videos have come to over the years, so I wasn't super optimistic. Now, after watching the video, I was quite impressed with the accuracy of the information, the way in which it was presented, and the fair and reasonable conclusions that he came to. I mean, 10 out of 10 video. You love to see it. Someone actually getting... Someone actually getting this shit right for once, dude. Now, after that one video, I admit I was beginning to think that I might have a new Tarkov science spirit animal. Now, not long after that, someone asked me if I had seen a clip from one of his recent streams where he'd experienced what seemed like extremely bizarre and apparently suspicious circumstances. His teammate, Smitty Stone, was also live at the time, and he was the first point of contact in this engagement. So let's take a look at his perspective first. Yeah. Dude, he's just blatantly cheating. Okay, now on to Rengar's perspective. Dude, he's just blatantly cheating. The original clip I was shown was from his stream a few days after the original event, when he was watching the footage back trying to figure out what had happened. Now, of course, the reason why this was brought to my attention was because the clip showed him coming to this conclusion. Like, the audio on mine is still broken regardless. But, regardless, the audio doesn't play from the right spot. Like, the sound is still bugged on my screen. Regardless. The vertical audio is still broken regardless. One, I didn't hear this guy rotate. Two, I didn't hear somebody run up the metal stairs. Three, I didn't hear somebody on metal ever. And four, the M4 played a floor above me. And then someone told me that there are less problems with binaural audio, that it's better. You don't get backwards audio with binaural audio. And my point was, yes, you do, because in this clip, I am literally using binaural because I tested it for a week because my chat was saying, binaural is better, binaural is better. It is not better. Nikita himself said, don't use binaural. It's worse. You just think that it's too, too much, like you have uh, slowly uh, going into the madness uh, with the sounds, just disable the binaural, binaural sound. How to say it in English? Binaural, Bin yeah. A neural, a neural sound, then it will be better. So maybe I spoke a little too soon about my new science spirit animal. There's a few things to touch on here. First, I want to point out that his interpretation of what Nikita said wasn't correct, and for some reason that seems to be going around at the moment. The context of that conversation was about people complaining about how they're annoyed with the ghost sounds. What Nikita was basically saying was that if the ghost sounds really bother you that much, turn off binaural and the problem will go away. When he said, it will be better, the it in that case referring to ghost sounds. He's not saying the audio is better with binaural off. I spent some time on stream analyzing the clip, which of course was taken out of context as all clips inherently are, but even went so far as to open up the VOD and try and take a look at the context from before and after the clip. So there I was, live on stream, watching a clip of a streamer, analyzing a clip from a past broadcast from himself and another streamer, this is what my life has come to. Of course, I made sure to grab the clip, take note of it in my script for this video, and plan to add it to my list of situations that I was going to need to debunk. Now, here's a quick summary of my tentative conclusion. At the time, there were three people involved here, Rengar, Smitty Stone, and a single enemy. 
Now his teammate, who I was told has Steam Audio off, threw a grenade towards where he had last seen his enemy, on the opposite side of the blue tanks, and even though the audio of his enemy's footsteps clearly indicates that the enemy was pushing around the left side, away from the grenade, it appears that he misjudged those steps, as many of us do in this situation, pre-firing the right side of the tanks and then falls back, proceeding to push up the metal stairs into the lobby. As he was making his way up the steps, he just missed noticing the enemy with the suppressed M4 pushing around towards the left under the stairs, who managed to get a shot off, hitting him in the face shield, although there was probably a few hundred milliseconds of desync or lag that caused the hit to register slightly late. Due to what I can only speculate was a combination of him being confused by the audio cues and being shot in the face from what seemed like nowhere, his teammates seemed fairly certain that they were fighting a cheater. Now, Rengar heard the grenade throw and the initial teammate pre-firing with the mutant and ran up the steps into the room with the big blue boilers without full visual context around the situation given his initial position. He turns the corner and due to some unfortunate timing and positioning, doesn't see the enemy behind the blue tanks, and at the same time confuses the suppressed M4 shots as originating from the only player that he can see, his teammate at the top of the stairs. Now in reality, given what we know, it makes sense that the shots are coming from underneath. We can even see the impacts on the railing towards where his teammate was, and see for a brief moment his teammate was in full sprint, something you normally wouldn't be able to do while simultaneously firing your gun. But of course, this guy's a cheater, right? Anything can happen. Now after the M4 shots stop, his teammate calls out that the guy was a blatant cheater, at which time I'd be willing to bet if I was in the same situation, I'd probably assume that my teammate had said that in response to having just been killed, which would give him even more reason to believe that the guy he saw just ran up the steps into the lobby was the enemy. So when he gets up to the top of the stairs, he starts firing as soon as he sees him. This scenario was unlucky timing, less than optimal communication, and the typical Tarkov netcode all combining together to create a cluster of a situation. One more instance of the poor sacrificial lamb that is Steam Audio taking one for the team. Now later in the stream that I took a look at these clips, guess who happened to show up in my chat? Now after bringing up the clip and sharing my interpretation of what I believed happened, I was ready for a host of yeah buts and well, what about this or that, but Instead, I got this. Do you blame Steam Audio? Oh my god. Oh my god! Holy shit. I think I'm in love. This is exactly what I'm talking about. Now unfortunately, even though he had come to what I think is the correct realization at a later point in time, the damage had been done. The idea that Steam Audio was bad had been injected into the minds of many people who were watching. Clips were created, stories were told, the myth continues. At least in this case, this story has a happy ending. Recently there was an update to Tarkov that's worth mentioning because of a few bugs that were posted in the recent patch notes. Multiple issues that they allegedly fixed were directly related to multiple situations where players might not make sounds that you'd expect them to hear neither of them having anything to do with Steam Audio. Of course, I have to wonder, how many of the situations where streamers or community members experienced the nebulous problem of missing audio and blamed it on Steam Audio when they were actually caused by these two bugs, or the untold number of other cases where audio might be scuffed that's unrelated to binaural sound? I really hope by now I don't need to share more examples of folks wrongly blaming the binaural boogeyman to convince you that our gut reactions are not always the best ones. This video has gone on way too long, and I literally have a separate document that's about 20 pages long of all the things I took out to save time. When we take the time to think critically, analyze the situation, and listen to feedback that perhaps doesn't agree with our initial conclusions, that's when we're most likely to end up on the right side of things. That's what happens when you don't take it personally, when you're not too stubborn or scared of looking stupid when you admit you're wrong. Our boy Rengar humbly admitted that he was wrong in the face of evidence, and not only does that not make him look silly or stupid, it in fact makes me think that he might be one of the smartest guys in the community. Major props to him and everybody else that's had their mind changed throughout the last couple of months that I've been involved in these discussions. Now once again, the more you know, the easier it is to make sense of all these things. This last anecdote I want to share is related to the conclusions that we come to, what we tell ourselves and the people around us based on those conclusions, and about finding the truth. It's also something that a depressing number of people still don't know about, so I may as well kill another bird with this stone 
this time related to repairing damaged face shields. This video had been created as a guide for how to fix visibly damaged face shields. As for many people in the community for quite a long time, it was believed that it was impossible to get rid of cracks from bullet damage even when their durability had been successfully repaired. Now, visual damage on face shields couldn't be seen when normally inspecting face shields from your inventory, so in order to determine if the face shield was cracked, you'd have to go into your hideout. Now, after identifying that it was damaged, once you repaired it and went back to the hideout to double check, the visual damage appeared to remain, indicating to players that the repair process did not, in fact, remove the cracks. According to the video, if you wanted to repair it properly, you needed to do the process I just outlined, and then enter an offline mode raid, immediately extract, go back to your hideout, and voila, it was fixed. Now, despite this video getting over 200,000 views, with the comments section being full of people giving endless thanks and praise for a video finally showing a solution to this issue, none of that was actually necessary, because there was never an issue with repairing face shields at all. Now, this was one of those topics that, for some reason, so many people felt so strongly about. I swear, some people in chat would have bet their houses on every single aspect of this bug, all of the specific details, how there was no way to visually repair face shields unless you went through this special process. Now, naturally, every time this was brought up, it came as a surprise to many of us in the community that have been repairing face shields for years without ever experiencing this issue. I've been debunking this myth for over two years now, with dozens of people every week telling me that I'm wrong, no matter how many times I demonstrate the opposite. The fact that I could successfully repair my face shields and use them in raid without any visual damage wasn't evidence that maybe they had been mistaken. Instead, it solidified their frustrations even more now that they believed that the issue had been limited to just them and their friends. Allow me now to explain to you the cause of this Tarkov urban legend. There seems to be a process that the game goes through that's responsible for initializing or loading all of the items you have on you, the items in your stash, etc. Let's just call it an item refresh. Now this process doesn't happen all the time, such as when you repair a piece of armor and you can see the durability update. The armor's numerical values are updated, but this isn't the same as a full item refresh process. While the armor's durability values are updated, this isn't the same as a full item refresh which happens to do a few additional things, including updating the graphical state of a damaged face shield that's been repaired. There are likely a number of different ways that you can initiate the full item refresh process, although I only know of two that are going to be relevant here. First is when your stash is loaded or reloaded, such as when you first launch the game or when you're coming back to your stash after leaving any raid, and the second being when you enter an online raid. Now this makes sense as when you enter an online raid, the game needs to do everything it can to ensure everything you're taking in with you is up to date. When you enter an offline raid, it's not really that important, so the game probably skips this step or it was simply an oversight, which is why entering an offline raid will show the face shield still broken and is probably related to all sorts of other invalid state information when you enter an offline mode raid, like when the game doesn't register that you're wearing active headphones unless you unequip them and then re-equip them. Something many of us have known about for just about as long. Now isn't it cool how the more you understand about how things work, it becomes way easier to understand how other things work, or in this case, don't work. The original video basically says you need to pray five times to Nikita, sacrifice 11 hatchlings, delete a Bitcoin from your stash, and then when you enter a raid, your problem's going to go away. When in reality, all you needed to do was enter the online raid. None of the other stuff mattered. Well, congratulations. You now understand how humanity ended up with pretty much every single absurd superstition that we've ever come up with. We are inherently shit at knowing what causes what and just assume that whatever happened before the one time we got a different result must have been the relevant factor. Now it's also why this comment on the video happens to be my favorite, because it perfectly demonstrates how we so easily come to wrong conclusions and never think twice about it. I'd be willing to bet that the patch that he suspects is what broke repairs was the patch when they introduced the hideout two and a half years ago, but not because they actually broke anything, instead because they added a significantly more accessible and much more commonly used way to experience an existing bug. The number of times people go into their hideout to use the shooting range has to be significantly more than the number of times players go into offline raids. 
that pretty much explains the whole thing. Now recently on stream, I pulled up the original video to show somebody one of the many ways in which a myth like this spreads like wildfire, and I suddenly recognized the name of the person who had made the video, Shudaville, a fantastic member of my community for multiple years. When I first came across the video, I don't think I actually noticed who had made it, but now that I knew that it was a buddy of mine, I had to first give him some friendly ribbing about it and then explain the whole thing. Now his response was a work of art, like chef's kiss. If there's a best way to deal with constructive criticism and having your mind changed about being proven wrong, this is a pretty damn good candidate. Back when I was a fledgling YouTuber, I made a video. As I was still fresh in Tarkov, I, I wanted to help people. I demonstrated how to fix a face shield, or at least how I thought you had to. Now the video was doing well, but I started to notice comments. I tested it, and alas, you could just go into raid, but the numbers, Mason, <laughs> the damn numbers. I let the video stay up because it's all about that money. And then this happened. <laughs> now, there was even a video, a Shudaville. Yeah. Uh, good fucking good guy, nice dude, decent videos. Mm -hmm. I was actually looking, I'm like, somebody made a video. I'm like, I forget who it was. And when I looked it up, I'm like, oh, fuck, it's Shudaville. <laughs> um, but it was like, how to fix face shields. Like, how to yep. get around the face shield bug. I don't, offline mode. I've been called out on my clickbait. I've changed the title. I am sorry for those I have offended. This was a severe lapse in my judgment. And I've used the time since the podcast to reflect inwardly. And I've really asked myself the hard questions, such as how many idiots still do this? And will I clickbait again? Hell yeah, baby. Look at the numbers, Mason. Cause it's all about that money. I'll be the Joe. First, I want to say, well played, sir. Second, I have to point out how this is just another depressingly perfect example of the nature of how misinformation on platforms like Twitch and YouTube spreads like wildfire and how the algorithms love to reward it rather than the truth. A 50 second short telling people about how to fix a bug that never existed in the first place, 200,000 views. A two minute video that's both a correction to the original and also filled with some pretty funny memes, 1300 views. Now, people ask me why I care so much about these topics, why I'm constantly talking about these things. Every time I'm asked that question, I can't help but be reminded of this quote from Hitchens. Well, but that's the thing I would need you to understand. You're, you're quite sure. happy to believe this. Why can't you keep it to yourself? Uh, I'm, why can't you keep your atheism to yourself? Because the religious won't allow me to. Because every time I open the paper, there's another instance of theocratic encroachment on free society, which I won't put up with. Up with which I will not put. Well, that's clear. I wouldn't have to talk about this stuff at all if there was nobody going around spreading misinformation about a game as facts. A game I love and happen to understand quite well. Oh, fucking... Okay. I was going to go into a bunch more detail about topics like compression, EQ, skills, like perception, and the use of headphones, but f*** me if this video hasn't gone on way too long already. Maybe I'll make a video about these things, but probably not. In the meantime, let me give you as short of a summary as I can. Adding compression hardware or software is not only unnecessarily overcomplicating your audio setup, which will add more points of failure and potential confusion, but it's also extremely unlikely that you're going to get any sort of advantage at all. In fact, there's very good reason to think that not only will the reduction in dynamic range of the audio not actually increase your chances of hearing or noticing sounds, but it will also make it objectively harder to accurately gauge the precise distance of those sounds. If you can't hear footsteps in Tarkov, either Tarkov is broken, like we've discussed many times before, or you need to pay closer attention. People that think that they need to crank their volume in order to hear footsteps are simply wrong. If your volume is so loud that it's even mildly uncomfortable, it's way too loud. Myself and plenty of others have no trouble hearing sounds, assuming Tarkov isn't busted, with every possible audio setup under the sun, from $5 earbuds to $1,000 headphone-DAC amp combos. 
Unless you're using a couple of paper cups connected with string to play Tarkov, you shouldn't be blaming your headphones on your inability to hear sounds, and you shouldn't be looking to compression or EQ as your solution. And when it comes to the perception skill, the primary difference between level 1 and elite level 51 is the distance you can hear sounds. Now, contrary to what most folks will say, the difference is actually considerably less than the 35% that you see on the skills page, and even if it was 35%, that's likely way less significant than you think. When comparing level 1 with elite perception, when your PMC is not wearing a helmet or headphones, the difference in hearing distance is going to be in the realm of 5 to 10 meters, which translates roughly to about a second and a half. Now the most significant difference between elite and level 1 perception can be seen when wearing active headphones, which had a hearing distance difference of about 14 meters, which again, given the running speeds in Tarkov, is only a few footsteps. And the ability to hear those couple footsteps at the max range of your hearing also assumes that there's literally no other audio happening at the time, like gunshots, healing, your teammates comms over discord, or even your PMC's own breathing inside of the helmet. At which point those sounds will very likely overpower your ability to hear those distant footsteps until the steps are loud enough to be heard easily, pretty much regardless of skill level or headwear. Now I'm not here to argue that the perception skill doesn't give you an advantage. That's kind of like the whole point of skills in the first place. Why would you have a skill system that doesn't give you abilities that you didn't have before or makes some abilities you already have more effective? I'm not interested in debating whether or not the skill needs to be nerfed or whether or not it's OP. I genuinely don't care, although I will say that trust me, the difference is very likely significantly less than you're assuming, and at the end of the day, the reason why you level 1 Timmies are dying to elite level Giga Chans is not because they heard you earlier. I promise. As I wrap up here, I want to say that the point of this video is not to try to sell you on Steam Audio. What I do care about is that the community understands these things as much as possible, that they have enough knowledge to make a truly informed decision. Now, someday soon, if we're lucky, those little ghost sounds are going to go away. We'll get more updates to the audio, be it the core audio system or Steam Audio. There's going to be more features, more improvements, and more bugs. When that day comes, it would be really unfortunate if large portions of the community ignored these changes, keeping Steam Audio off in their games just because of some rumors or hearsay. Someday, probably a bit further into the future, they're hopefully going to replace the vast majority of the existing audio system with the remaining modules of Steam Audio. It'll be undoubtedly buggy and have issues, and as long as we're careful and constructive with our feedback, BSG will address them and we'll be that much closer to having phenomenal audio in Tarkov. That is the solution to these problems. I really do believe that we're much closer to that than most people realize. Whenever some day comes, I just want people to know the fundamentals about how this stuff works, some of the basic terminology, some of the interesting and complex aspects involved, to think about the ways in which people have misunderstood these things before, how rumors spread, the mental or emotional pitfalls that we run into, causing us to come to the wrong conclusion, how to test theories, how to isolate variables, it's not just audio, it's everything. Features, bugs, ballistics, netcode, AI design, user experience. It's also not just Tarkov, and also not just video games. I hate to get grandiose here, but for f**k's sake, applying some honest, critical thinking and a healthy dose of skepticism to everything in our lives, from geopolitics to economics and medicine, is exactly what we need more than anything right now. While a little bit of knowledge can go a long way, it can also be dangerous. If we all learn the bare minimum, or worse yet, don't bother and just accept what we're told by somebody else, all that's ever proven to do is make things more divisive, more controversial. The default behavior ends up being blame and dismissal. As soon as we all learn how to think critically and to properly come to our own conclusions, that's when it's going to become trivial to have our minds changed or at the very least identify fact from fiction, value judgment from objective truth. After a few hours of teaching myself a little bit of Unity, tinkering with my little Steam Audio app, I managed to fully implement the remaining modules of Steam Audio and tried to replicate some of the environmental conditions we see in the world of Tarkov. I learned a few things that I think are worth sharing here. First, while the initial integration was relatively easy, and the quantity and complexity of things you can customize is remarkably less than I thought there would be, I can't stress enough how the full integration of Steam Audio and Tarkov is 
anything like the walk in the park for BSG that folks assume it will be. Ignoring the challenges they've faced upgrading their engine multiple times and dealing with all of the inescapable tech debt they've accrued over the years, I genuinely think that they'll be able to pull it off just as soon as they can sort out the performance concerns introduced by the integration of a complicated system into a, let's say, less than optimized game. There's nothing wrong with complaining about stuff every now and then or being salty about all sorts of things, from audio issues to cheaters and everything in between. We all do it. Once more, there's nothing wrong with being wrong. I challenge you to be honest with yourself, deny the urge to dig in your heels and be stubborn, listen to other people, and look for others who disagree with you. Don't try to rationalize or justify everything. This goes to all of my content creator friends as well. Ask more questions, make less assumptions, try having your mind changed, and admitting you were wrong. The more this happens, the more it becomes just as enjoyable as vindication. If you've done your homework, if you really know what you're talking about, stick to your guns, even if nobody else believes you. The truth isn't democratic, it's not a popularity contest. Don't take comfort in being in agreement with the majority. Hitchens said it best when he said, take the risk of thinking for yourself. Much more happiness, truth, beauty, and wisdom will come to you that way. Be mindful about giving people advice or spreading hearsay and anecdotal experience throughout the community as if it's fact. If you decide you want to, then you damn well better be sure that you can back up what you're saying, because somebody might call you out for it. And if you don't know your shit, if you haven't done your homework, then some asshole like me is going to take three months to make a three hour long overly produced video telling you all the ways in which you're wrong. And ultimately, at the end of the day, that's the real travesty here. Think about all the fun you'd be having otherwise if you'd spent the last three hours playing Escape from Tarkov. Any video essay form?